Hello all and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the Digital Audio Protocols webinar, uh, specifically focusing on the digital audio protocols most important uh, to Digico, those that you're going to see most frequently. We're going to try to take a deep dive, understand uh, a lot more about these protocols, also on the console side of things, how to set them up, um, some limitations, some features and benefits, and we're going to take a deep dive. But before we get started with that, I just wanted to say hello and welcome. Uh, obviously, very odd times for us uh, across the world, but uh, thank you for taking time out of whatever you're doing to join us here today. Uh, my name is Ryan Shelton. I'm going to be one of your hosts today. We actually have a, a team here together to make sure we're taking care of you from all aspects. Uh, the first I wanted to introduce is actually Dan Page. He's joining us from just outside of London. Uh, Dan Page is our brand ambassador uh, at Digico, and he's been Good around. Good evening, everybody. Hey, Dan. Uh, how long have you been with Digico? Uh, 12 years. 12 years. Fantastic. Uh, and then also running uh, production as well as part of the presentation, Kyle McMahon. Uh, Kyle, can you say hi there? Hello, everybody. So uh, Kyle normally handles a lot of the U.S. training for Digico. Uh, and then we also have in the wings Matt Larson, uh, who is our VP at Group One, who's the distributor. Uh, so if you want to say hi, we're all here and available to Hello, everybody. take to take questions, um, answer those questions, as well as what we have prepared for you today. Speaking of that, we are obviously broadcasting onto YouTube Live. Uh, you're here watching us, that's good. Uh, a couple of notes. One, there's a comment section. I was looking at it earlier. It looks like a lot of you have found that. This is a great way for you to get your question to us. Uh, Dan and Matt are gonna be monitoring that uh, those comments, obviously for you troublemakers, kick you out of there. But for those of you that have good questions, uh, we'll be taking those and we'll be putting those up and answering those questions as well. Um, also, if you're new to YouTube or maybe you just have a default setting one way or the other, there's a little gear icon in the bottom right of your window, and that is the quality settings. We are going to be showing you uh, a mixture of video presentations, uh, screenshots, uh, live video from the console, etc. And the higher you have this quality setting, the sharper that image is going to be, the easier the text is going to be to read, etc. So if you uh, probably a minimum should be about 720. Uh, and if your internet supports it, you should probably go up to 1080 uh, for that quality. I, I will also take the uh, opportunity to mention the fact that we are doing this all at our homes. Uh, so we are running off of consumer internets uh, with consumer routers and switches and Wi-Fi in some cases. Uh, so if you do uh, lose us for any reason, we have some backups in place and we are gonna get back up and going. Uh, so uh, hopefully we won't have any of that today, but just please be patient with us if it does happen. So we'll be, uh, we'll be able to jump right back on and pick up where we left off. Um, Let's see here. So we talked about who we are, uh, what we're going to cover, uh, questions, comments. Uh, Kyle has a link he's going to throw up for you guys. Uh, and this is actually a link to a Dropbox folder that we've put together of training documents. Uh, if you uh, may know, you can just use your cameras uh, on your smartphone, that camera app, point it at the screen. You don't have to take a picture. But once it's shown on the QR code, it will highlight it and then put a link um, somewhere on your phone for you to touch and open up that folder. Uh, and this is going to take you to a Dropbox folder. A lot of the technical notes that we're going to reference in today's webinar are there. We also have quick start guides. Uh, we have a lot of resources for you there as well. So Kyle, I'll leave that up for just a few seconds uh, so you can get out um, that as well. Uh, Dan, I believe, has a link that he can throw into the comments as well uh, for those of you not using um, the uh, smartphones, QR codes, or if it's just easier. We can do that in a little bit also. Uh, so you have a copy of that as well. Um, in addition to the technical notes that we're going to provide you in this link, there are hundreds and hundreds of technical notes that are available from Digico. Uh, they can take care of everything from how to replace a panel or a fader driver board on a console to upgrading software, uh, also things like how word clocking works within OptiCore. So we have a lot of resources available to you. If there's something that you uh, think you need, questions you may have, reach out to your distributors, wherever you're located in the world. Uh, ask them for, uh, you know, any Digico has any information that it's usually in the form of a tech note. Uh, we publish a lot of those on the website as well. So uh, the website is probably the first place to go to check for those. Uh, and then we've kind of collated the ones you may need uh, dealing with OptiCore, dealing with Maddie, and things like that in this uh, training link that we just showed. Uh, 
So um, I am Ryan Shelton. I work with Group One Limited, who's the distributor in the U.S. for Digico. Um, I'm a national sales manager is actually my title. Uh, previous to that, um, I worked in both support as well as doing a lot of the education aspect that Kyle uh, has taken on as well as part of our what we call our Digico Master Series. Uh, these are classes we do around the U.S. Kyle is going to take you uh, through that in a little bit, uh, tell you what those are. This is uh, essentially an excerpt from that. Uh, we've expanded it a little bit beyond the normal so we could do a deeper dive. Um, and really with all that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Um, just Kyle, where, where do we start with all this? Okay, just one second. Somebody was asking in uh, the uh, comment section for the training links again. Um, again, with the training links, QR code, take your phone, point it at it, um, and it's going to highlight the uh, Dropbox link and it's going to save it. It's going to save it in its current state. So that means if we make changes in the future, you won't have those changes. So after we get done with this presentation and we go to actually publish this uh, into uh, YouTube as a, a public link, and at that point, we're going to try to take that Dropbox link that has some, uh, some of the training in, uh, materials inside, uh, inside, the, uh, uh, inside that YouTube link. So, all right, kind of come back to you for just a second, Ryan, before I go to myself. Sounds good. All right, uh, so um, let's see. From there, uh, Ryan, it says uh, we're going to go into session structure. I think yes. we need to go into, uh, we're supposed to go into our uh, slideshow now with you mm -hmm. going over the, the protocol section. Oh. Before we go into session structure. I think you are, uh, I think you're right. So let's Sorry do that. About that. I did not catch that earlier. All right, coming to you right now. Sure. So let's start off digging into the protocols you're most commonly going to see in Digico. Uh, the two main ones you're going to see are MADI, which is standard on pretty much every device that we make, and then OptiCore. That is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is a third-party protocol that is developed uh, in, I believe it's uh, just outside of Germany, um, and blanking on the country it's actually from right now my apologies uh, but it's a protocol that is a fiber based ring transport system so we're going to start off digging into MADI we're going to go deeper into OptiCore uh, and then we'll just keep going uh, from there and then uh, as Kyle mentioned we'll take uh, the session structure uh, and build up a session and learn how to configure all this all right so I always call this the most boring part of any presentation but I feel like it's important to go over the details just so you know both the benefits and the limitations of these protocols uh, first a little little history on MADI. MADI was adopted as an AS standard, AS10. That uh, was back in 1991. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, early digital console manufacturers came together to form that standard. Uh, they supported it early on. The important part is they made it an open standard. Um, obviously, AES had a big part of that. But also what I mean by open standard is not just license free, is the fact that it could adapt to a lot of different use cases. So originally it was designed for digital recording consoles and digital tape machines uh, to record uh, and push audio back and forth both directions. Uh, obviously we've adapted that and both the broadcast industry uses it massively, uh, the live audio industry uses it, um, and actually oddly enough less so used in the recording industry these days. Um, but it's a very flexible protocol. And diving into some of the specs, uh, just so you can see this, um, the first one that we get into is, is actually how you physically get it from one place to another. Kyle, could you throw up the slides for me there? So with if we look at MADI B and C, um, it is the spec calls for 56 or 64 channels. When it was originally released, it was 56 channels plus control data. Uh, back in the recording days, that was for arming tracks, disarming tracks, uh, transport controls, etc. cetera. Um, nowadays, uh, like with Digico, we actually use that for gain data. So we can talk back and forth between a console and a rack. We use that same leftover space, uh, so 56 channels plus the control data. You can also change our, all of our ports to 64 channel ports. This gets rid of the control data, but gives you eight more channels of audio. So same cable, uh, this would be applicable if you were taking uh, audio out of a console to a multi-track recording interface. You don't want all the control or don't need it because maybe those two devices don't talk to each other and you're just wanting as much audio down that line as possible. So 56 or 64 channels at 48K. Now, when you go to 96K, those numbers cut in half. So if you've ever wondered on a Digico system why we go to 28 channels at 96K, it's because it's normally 56 at 48K and we're halving that into 28. Uh, now, 56 channels, we have a thing that's called 
a channel 57, that's where the control data shows up on. Um, it's a lot of fun, if you have the time, uh, to take one of our racks, plug them into other various manufacturers' consoles, if you have access to those, and you'll actually see a bunch of noise on channel 57. That's our control data as it's being pushed down. Um, all of our consoles know to accept that, to read it, to be able to send back as well. Uh, but for the most part, uh, every other device, just about every other device can block. You can put it in a 56 channel mode and it will block out that data as well. Now, uh, the BNC specification is for a 75 ohm coaxial cable. Uh, originally, this was RG59. Uh, that's how it's referred to it here in the U.S. and North America. Uh, that has been surpassed by RG6, which is basically the same thing, but with uh, thicker insulators and shields. Obviously meant for high-definition video, but it's more than adequate to carry uh, MADI BNC um, 64 channels at uh, 48K. Uh, the length is one of the greatest questions in MADI. The actual spec calls for 100 meters, so for our U.S. friends, that's 328 feet, um, but 100 meters is considered what it is known to work at in most operating conditions. Now, if you have a, a lot of panel mount connectors, um, barrel connectors, you're extending that cable, um, doing things like that, you're effectively reducing the range or the length of that cable. Uh, it's all about the voltage drop and the noise that we're getting into the cabling. Um, usually, with most decent barrel connectors, uh, RG59 or RG6 cabling, the voltage drop is not really an issue. What we usually run into is RF interference or noise that'll actually get into there, and that's usually through things like barrels or panel mount connectors. Um, now, you can actually go a bit beyond this. Um, and if you have a single high quality cable that's going from device to device, we know in most cases you can push this out to around 125 meters without issue. Uh, but once again, that's going to be case by case dependent as you get it beyond the 100 meter specification that AES calls for. Um, now, the other thing is, this is a unidirectional interface. Now, unidirectional means it sends in one direction and it receives in the other. Um, for those of you who are super nerds, uh, you'll know that just about every protocol is this way. However, for those of us um, that are more on the consumer side, we tend to think of an ethernet cable as magically doing both directions, while in reality, we're doing send and return uh, on various pairs within a, a Cat5 uh, connector. So this breaks out onto separate connectors, the send and the return. So we can actually go from the console output to the SD rack input. We go from the SD rack output to the console input. So it's out to in, out to in, uh, that way we have our two-way communication between those devices. So you will physically need to swap them, take care of them there. Now, why do we love Maddie? Uh, I always talk about this because I think it's important to know. Uh, if you've studied anything about technology, uh, usually at some point you'll run across something called the technology adoption curve. And the technology adoption curve simply means that as you, a new product or a new protocol is introduced, the, there's an adoption curve. So how fast is this uh, technology going to get adopted by the public or by those of you who are using it? Um, and normally it looks something like a bell shape. Um, now that may be actually extended, it may be more narrow, it depends on how prevalent and how useful and the longevity of that protocol. Um, MADI is such a weird protocol to me in that it doesn't seem to follow the normal technology adoption curve. Uh, it just is kind of this line that just keeps going up. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you've seen this across um, where you're at in the UK as well, but it just seems like more and more products are released every year that support MADI. It's yeah, absolutely. It's robust. It's you know stable. It's widely adopted. It's you know full bandwidth quality audio. It's just easy to use, easy to understand. Lots of people you know make products for it. It's it's great. We love it. So, so I have a couple theories on this, and I one of the ones that I keep coming back to. Obviously, you can build a product license free, which it can't be overlooked. So as a manufacturer, you don't have to pay royalties for putting Matty on something. There's a lot of uh, ready-made uh, products. Uh, that have like MADI drivers that you can add to your product relatively easily. The other thing is it is uncompressed 24-bit PCM audio. So that means there are no codecs. Uh, we're not dealing with delay uh, of packet-based audio like you do with audio over IP. Uh, the big one though is, um, as Dan mentioned, it is robust. So 
it works. Uh, there's no software that you have to launch to control this or configure this. Uh, it is designed originally to be point to point. So just take audio from here and get it to here. So you just take a cable, you plug it in. I always joke around, if it doesn't work, go get a cable, another cable, because that first cable is probably bad. Uh, it is super easy to work with. Products have been supporting this for a long time, so the, the protocol is known. Um, and then the last thing on this list is that it actually has incredibly low latency. Um, so this actually, you have to start factoring in things like how long your cable is uh, into uh, just how much latency there is between devices. Now, uh, Digico offers on most products a BNC MADI version of the protocol. Then they also offer a Cat5, or what's commonly referred to as a twisted pair, uh, MADI as well. So this was originally designed around Cat5e, so that's the specification we know for it. We also know that Cat6 works brilliantly, so if you're putting cable into uh, a new project, uh, definitely go for a Cat6. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of those. First off, it can handle the same number of channels with the same latency, the same bandwidth, all of that. We're really just changing out one format, a BNC cable for another physical format and ethernet cable in this um, in this case so 56 or 64 channels at 48k 28 or 32 channels at 96k we still have that channel 57 for control data now um, getting into the physical cable aspects you need something that's called shielded twisted pair now i also have seen this represented as shielded or s slash ftb so that shielded foil over twisted pair so that means that all of the bundles all of the pairs are actually wrapped in a common shield not individual pairs are shielded so i've seen some cable manufacturers do it both way uh, usually individual pairs being uh, shielded is vastly more expensive uh, and it's actually not necessary in our case. So a CAT6 cable that is S slash FTP, once again depending upon how the manufacturer references that, you need a foil over the entire uh, grouping of pairs uh, in that cable. Uh, now as far as lengths go, the CAT5, uh, CAT6 is very different. Uh, it tends to have a brick wall right at about 100 meters. Um, you can maybe push this a couple more meters either direction, but it is almost entirely a brick wall at that point. So once you go beyond there, um, you're, 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 it's definitely not guaranteed, not recommended. Uh, in fact, when we sell packages um, like a, an SD9 and a D2 rack that has a CAT6 cable that comes with it, we sell an upgraded version that goes to 100 meters. So not only are you getting a higher quality over that connection, you are actually doing a better job at rejecting noise, which is once again, tends to be the enemy in these environments. So not so much are we looking at a drop in voltage, we're looking at that RF interjection into the actual signal. Um, let's see here, so 100 meters is the length, uh, carries in and out over a single cable. So once again, that's done on the pairs inside uh, of the connector itself. It is still 24-bit PCM audio, still license-free as far as we're using it, uh, and it's gonna have the same latency specifications. So that's pretty much it. Um, Dan, did we get, or Matt, did we get any questions Questions about Maddie at that time? So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a, a question regarding foil versus braided shielding. Okay. Um, so on uh, the BNC versions of the Van Dam cables that actually we sell and are, of course, available through other distributors and through other places, um, the BNC version, we actually do use a foil uh, shield, uh, and that is primarily for, uh, I'm sorry, a braided shield, and that is primarily for the tour grade, a lay flat, um, easy to uh, lay down, easy to wind up, um, tie in a knot if you need to. Uh, the foil over version tends to be a little more rigid, uh, doesn't tend to lay as well, but it does give you 100% percent coverage, uh, meaning that it's going to do a better job at rejecting RF uh, than a traditional braided would be. Dan, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, it all comes down to, you know, there's, a, there's another question about, you know, solid core versus stranded, the, you know, the, the, the bend radius on cables, the way you handle it, if you're rolling it out on, um, you know, on tours, you know, that sort of specification is going to be important to you. As long as you're meeting our Cat 5e or better and sticking to the length, then all is good. Now, the one thing that is not on here that, Kyle, if we're making a note, we should probably add, is when you're dealing with uh, CAT 5e or CAT 6, we recommend, and we actually have a tech note for this, to talk about ferrite suppressors. Uh, so you've probably seen these. They're sometimes referred to as chokes, 
but they're actually ferrite, so a metal um, um, that sits right by the connector, uh, like an Ethercon connector uh, on either end of the device. So you're gonna have them on both ends of the device. Uh, and those also helped to reject noise and to keep it from getting into the line. Uh, so once again, the whole name of the game here is to keep the noise, the RF noise, out of the cables. Um, so those chokes are very important, uh, once again, to even to install as well as to touring applications. Ryan. Yes, sir. Uh, the other thing to mention is um, uh, when we're dealing with BNC cable, uh, mm -hmm. make sure when you're running it, say you run it out to front of house, do not have a coil of 40 or 50 feet of extra BNC cable laying there before it goes into your console. Your four and five watt two-way radios will leak into the system. It's becoming an ind induction coil at that point. So make sure, you know, if you've got so, some extra spread, uh, cable out at front of house, figure eight it. Make sure that uh, you don't keep a ton of extra cable. Otherwise, you can have uh, those radios will leak into the system. That is a very good point. Some of our uh, friends watching today, I'm sure, are somewhat RF specialist. Um, I'm sure we have a couple on there that are ham radio nerds as well. Um, and you gentlemen are knowing that you take a coil, uh, a wire, and you coil it up and you create an antenna. Um, and in this case, it's going to be an induction um, into that cable. So uh, what Kyle's saying there is absolutely valid. Uh, figure eight is going to solve that problem. Um, or, you know, you can do your best to avoid having a big coil of cable. Um, I usually make a joke in training somewhere about wrapping that big roll of, roll of cable around the power distro that has radio sitting on, on top of it as well. So you want to avoid that. Um, all right. Uh, what's the uh, what's the next slide in there? Okay. So here's a system diagram on uh, just how to simply wire a MADI connection. So a first thing to remember is MADI is point to point. MADI does not daisy chain from one device to the next. You can make some of those things work but it gets very complicated and you need routers uh, to actually handle channels. So for all intents and purposes, take something like a console, in this case we have a Digico SD10, connect it to an SD rack, you're actually gonna see two SD racks there and we're gonna connect to each of those separately. So we have two MADI ports on an SD10, we are gonna connect to the SD racks individually, so MADI port one and MADI port number two, you're gonna see that we're running at 48K. I know that because we have one cable going to the rack, one cable coming from the rack, uh, and that is gonna carry all the communication, all the control, all the audio, everything we need to control each of those racks. But please notice they are home runs. So they go individually from the racks to the console. All right, on the back of that SD10, this is gonna look very similar to a lot of the other consoles that we have across our line. And it really doesn't matter if that's an SD series, uh, an S series, or a Quantum. Uh, you're probably gonna have some form of MADI connections here. Uh, Kyle is zoomed in, we got a red box uh, down kind of that bottom uh, right-hand portion of your screen uh, that's gonna show you those MADI connections on the back of the SD10. These physically connect to the engine that processes the audio, and we're gonna connect right from the back of this console to the front of that SD rack, which I think, Kyle, we have a few more um, connection points or um, animation in that slide, and then he can yes. take us on Be to. Yeah, before we go into that, um, do notice on, on SD10, SD8, a lot of the consoles do have redundant pairs. So you've got MADI 1A, MADI 2A. Um, so MADI 1A is here, and then you got MADI 2A. There are redundant ports, so this is still MADI 1, but this is a B connection, so it's the redundant port of MADI 1A. So um, if you're hooking up to two different racks, you're going to plug in on this connection here and then this connection here. So just be make sure if you've got two different racks, if you plug them in here and here, they are not going to show up correctly. So just, just be mindful of that. Let's actually take a deeper dive into that real quick because uh, thank you for bringing that up, Kyle. Uh, what is a redundant pair for MADI? Uh, originally, um, when you're making touring systems, as most of you probably know, you want them to be as robust as possible. And if you want to take that up a notch, you put in a redundancy. So that whether that's a separate set of cables, in this case, this is a separate connection altogether that allows for a redundant connection to the rack. Um, or in the case of something like the SD7 or the Quantum 7, you actually have a physically separate redundant engine in that case. So what we've done here is we've added another port that is essentially just another set of MADI drivers to give you the same output, so the same thing will be sent uh, out of MADI 1A 
and MADI1B. So the outputs are the same. And then what happens on the input side is that whichever one sees clock first from a device like an SD rack, it is going to take from that one. They are not individually addressable. They are designed to be the exact same thing. If you connect a second rack to that MADI 1B, as you did the MADI 1A, it will not see the MADI 1B connection because it is expecting the same thing as a redundant. And if it loses that A, it will move over to the B, which is not how you'd want to run separate racks. That's how you'd want to run one rack as a redundant. Now, if you're on a new quantum console, we actually did away with the redundant physical ports, but we gave you twice as many ports, MADI ports that are available, and then we left a software redundancy feature in there as well. Uh, so we're gonna show you the audio IO section in a minute. I have a Q338 next to me, and that has software redundant MADI ports. So we can actually configure the ports the same way, uh, or we can break them out into individual MADI ports. So thank you for bringing that up, Kyle. Huge point, we do get a lot of questions. I one more thing to add in there, if I can, Please on do. the redundant ports. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just doing a single rack connection, a uh, single MADI connection from your rack to the console, actually it doesn't matter which you hook up to, 1A or 1B. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, you know, from a touring perspective, things get damaged on the road. If the back of your console takes a knock and you've damaged one set of ports, you can just hook up to the B ports and the console works out where the MADI is connected. So, you know, 1A versus 1B actually on a single MADI connection doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. All right, now while we're here, um, this uh, on the back of this SD10, you're gonna actually see two HMA OptiCore connectors. So we're gonna come back to that in a minute, but I just want you to see where they're located on something like an SD10. Um, just about every Digico console is gonna have some version of these. Uh, if you're working as an integrator or in a facility that has a permanently installed console, you're probably gonna see a different set of connectors. Those are most likely called SD connectors. We do do an optical con version as well. There are certain customers of ours who prefer those connectors. So there's about three different versions you're gonna see on OptiCore. The one you're seeing in this photo is called an HMA uh, or expanded beam uh, connector. Um, all right, Kyle, on from there, there's a Waves audio port. Uh, we are not gonna take a deep dive into the sound grid protocol from Waves. Um, I know Waves is doing a lot of webinars that are available as well, so it's probably good to check one of those out. We may jump into this at another point, um, but we're not gonna focus on that in today's webinar. But this, pro this port is a full 64 by 64 channel port at 96K, it's just built into that wave sound grid protocol. Um, you can connect to something like a, a multi-rack or super rack to, to run plugin processing. You can also run into uh, sound grid studio or uh, into super rack uh, to be able to multi-track record directly off of this port. So it is a full port that's available to you uh, for whatever you need it to do. Uh, there's a console network connection. Uh, we like pointing these out just so you know what is this is and what's available to it. This is just standard control. Like if I was gonna connect a, a wireless access point to uh, fire up an iPad app and to run that connected to the console. That's all this port is going to do. There's gonna be no audio. Um, we could take offline software connected to the console and iPad connected to the console, but that's what's gonna happen through this port. If you're using something like Clang or Waves, you're all also going to need this port to be able to connect to the computer Mac or PC that's running the software package to control those applications if you want the integration. And then we have word clock. Now word clock is just clocking, no audio. Also, I point this out, um, it was all co most commonly done on the SD9, and I would get a lot of, a lot of calls on this, that somebody would call me up and say, hey, the MADI input isn't working on this SD9. And just as you do, you go through the dummy checks, and you say, hey, could you just make sure that's not plugged into the word clock? Uh, and sure enough, it was. Um, did that a handful of times, um, and just enough so that I pointed out to the rest of you. Word clock is a separate physical connection. We're gonna go over clocking in a minute. So we'll take a little deeper dive and talk about some of those options, but that is the physical word clock input and output for the console, no audio. All right, Kyle, on to the MatiPod. So what we've actually taken is an image of the SD rack MatiPod, that is the top center section of the SD rack. Um, and um, this is all the IO, this is the menu settings. Uh, we can connect to here from a USB connection, which we're gonna show you in a minute to a number of different things. But this is the brains of the SD rack itself. Um, and for those of you who have had, ever had your hands inside of one of these, maybe swapping out optical connectors or something like that, you'll know that this 
this entire tray can actually be removed from the SD rack. So there is a very long PC board inside of that rack uh, to which things like an OptiCore or daughter board would sit and connect. Um, you would also have, um, you know, as you see on your front, your menu controls uh, to control the logic that is inside of the SD rack. So um, the D2 rack is another very popular rack that we have. And this is gonna have a very similar menu structure. We're gonna go through that in a second. It's not gonna have all the same features, but the, the navigation, the thought process here is exactly the same. Now, the only rack that we make that does not have an on-screen menu is the D rack. So it does have the same type of controls built into it. We just don't have a display for it. So you're gonna need to connect to that from your computer to be able to get into those controls. You can also do that directly from something like an SD9. So I could connect a D rack to that SD9 and get to things like the OptiCore ID uh, as well as a few other uh, functions on the D rack. All right, so let's dive into the Maddie Pod. So the Maddie Pod you're seeing here has a Maddie main connection. So um, just a second ago, Dan was talking about connecting your rack to your console on either Maddie 1A or 1B. This is the connection you would take from the SD rack to do so. So if you can get closely in there and see it, you're gonna see there's an in and there's an out. So the out is always at the top, the in's at the bottom, and I can know from my console, I take the output of my console, go to the in on this rack and out of the rack and go back to the in. That's the Maddie main. You're gonna see that those are labeled uh, channels one through 56, and then there's a uh, another diagram at the bottom that says one through 28. This is if you're running at 96K. Uh, so it cuts down to 28 channels on that first port. Uh, now we're now showing you the Matty aux connection. So this is an auxiliary or a redundant connection, and that's actually gonna let me connect that redundant pair to the SD10 that we showed you earlier on that redundant port. Now, if anything happened to the Matty main, it would switch over to the Matty uh, redundant connection here as well. If you're running at 96K, you need this second connection for channels 29 through 56 on the rack. So you're gonna need four cables, two in, two out um, on going from the console to the SD rack to be able to have all 56 channels at 96K. From there, you're gonna have what's called a MADI split. Now this part is unique to the SD rack, the SD mini rack. Those share the same MADI pod and thus the same features from here. So this MADI split uh, can do the same thing. It is just designed to give you a split of whatever is being fed into this rack. So it's a very simple but very powerful feature. So if we take our analog ins, our AS ins, anything that we're feeding into this SD rack, they are gonna come out the MADI main out the Matty Aux, and then out the Matty Split as well. You'll notice that there's two Matty Splits, and they are just the output side. So there's actually not an input here. This is just designed purely for a split application. So uh, the process and the thought process here is that we could connect to our main console via the Matty main. We could even connect to a monitor console off of the Matty aux, and that would be just be the send only. And then we could take a Matty split and send this to a record, um, broadcast truck, or somebody that wants a split of those inputs. Now, there is actually a lot of logic and processing that we can put on that Matty split. Um, the first thing is, if you are running your SD rack at 96K, you can use both of those MADI splits to get all the channels out at 96K. There is a menu option to be able to do what's called a system divided by two sample rate. So if the rack is running at 96K, we can make those outputs at 48K. This is incredibly useful for those of you who've interfaced with broadcast trucks. Um, so you wanna run your touring system or your installation, your room at 96K, um, excuse me, but a broadcast truck uh, is only going to ever want to see 48K. So we can, on the rack, convert down to 48K and send that out. And that actually gives us two splits at 48K. The other bit of processing that we have there is called gain tracking. For those of you who are used to the Digico ecosystem, you've probably heard that term in reference to consoles, where I can set up a monitor and a front of house console to gain track from each other. So one is going to be in control of the mic prees, and the other console is going to be gain tracking off of the first. So if the monitor console turns up a mic pre by 6 dB, the front of house console would automatically, in real time, turn down by 6 dB, giving you a net zero change in the level that's coming into the console. 
We can apply that same processing directly here at the SD rack for those MADI split outputs. So that means if I want to send a constant level output to broadcast or to recording, I can do that through use of this, um, this gain tracking feature. So that's all controlled via the menu. We're going to show you that in a second. After the MADI split, um, you're actually going to go on to word clock. So this is if you want to provide an external word clock reference into a rack or if you want an output from here to something else. So uh, typically, if we want our system to sync to something like video, we would actually take a video reference clock, um, so something I can spit out a word clock signal, and put it into the SD rack. And that would actually, um, if it was an OptiCore network, would actually reclock the entire network. Kyle's going to go over that with you in just a minute as well. But this is a good way to get word clock in and out of the rack as you need it. Uh, before we, we still go there, guys? On, yes. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hey, uh, so before we go on from word clock, uh, if you are running OptiCore and you are bringing a word clock into the system, you're always going to go to the uh, plug it into the device with the lowest network ID. So if it's rack 1.11, you're going to bring your clock into that, and then OptiCore will automatically look for either the console with the lowest network ID, or if it's plugged into a rack, the rack with the lowest network ID, and every device on the network will see that same clock. All right, uh, as we're gonna reference in a minute and show you this, but the Technical Note 300 will cover that in detail. Our, our lovely Tony Crockett from the UK uh, put that together for us. Um, and so it goes into great detail on how to configure your OptiCore systems for clocking. Uh, now, speaking of OptiCore, this is an option on the SD racks. Uh, the vast majority of racks, SD racks, in North America are configured with OptiCore. Um, then from there, there's a handful that do MADI only. I know it varies greatly across the world, um, but just so you know, that is an option. So OptiCore does not have to come on the rack, but it is part of that a typical OptiCore system, a typical console package that we're gonna see in North America at least. So these are the OptiCore HMA or expanded beam. It's a military grade or mil spec connector, very rugged uh, company we use called Fiberco and manufactures these fantastic thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of connections that these things are rated for. Um, super easy to clean, very robust, as you would imagine. Also with that, expensive. So, you know, you get what you pay for in that. Um, I will show you some ST wiring diagrams in a minute, um, but if this did have ST connectors on this SD rack, you would actually have four individual connections on there because an HMA connector actually has two uh, strands of fiber and two lenses uh, per connector. So you're actually doing a send and return per that, what you see is like labeled A on that ST rack Matty pod. Um, and if that were broken out in ST connectors, you would have individual ST connectors in, in and out for A. Um, all right, and then the last thing to mention on this rack is actually the USB connection. So it's important to note that this is control only. We can't just plug it in and record straight to our laptop, which would actually be pretty cool. But there is a, um, I am convinced permanently in beta uh, software from Digico um, that's called Digico Control um, that is available for Mac and PC. Don't think it's supported in the latest version of Catalina for Mac because it is a 32-bit app. So once again, it'll stay in beta. But anyway, this app lets me directly control the mic pre's on the SD rack. So I can actually get in there control. I can set things like OptiCore IDs. I can set things like sample rate. Uh, I can turn on and off the internal uh, word clock that's inside of the rack itself. So if I'm using this in a standalone app, application. I can do that. Now, there is a, another option in the menu structure to change that USB from controlling the rack to controlling the OptiCore card. Um, if you've been a Digico user for a long time and you were version, remember, I think it was version 681. Does that sound right, Dan? Uh, when we actually had to do the version 5 update to the OptiCore cards, that uh, you would have... Right, yeah. Yeah, you would have had to take your uh, like a Windows computer of some kind, a laptop or a PC, uh, and take the OptiCore folder from your console, put it on the laptop, and then push that update to the OptiCore module itself. Uh, and that would have happened through that USB connection. Um, I have fond memories. I don't know if Brandon is watching from Gateway, um, but going over to Gateway Church where they have a lot of consoles. They have a lot of SD7s, which requires this done to each engine, and a lot of SD racks. And we spent all day uh, going through and updating these 
OptiCore firmware is on all the devices. It's not something we commonly change. Most of the time we do it on the back end in software, but sometimes you do need it to happen within the firmware. Uh, I believe one of the best things to come out of that firmware update was the ability for us to do more than just 56 uh, total uh, virtual console sends, that we could actually do uh, 56 from each of the consoles that were on the network, providing there's room for it. All right, that's pretty much it to do with the Matipod. Um, this right here is a manual that's available for the SD rack that's available on the website. Uh, Kyle, is this one available in that uh, folder link that you sent out earlier? Yeah, and the Dropbox link uh, that I sent earlier, um, it is inside that. There's a couple screenshots of this one and the following one. We'll go back to this one. Also, by the way, I've seen in the comments that uh, people are saying my mic is still a little bit low. It looks like uh, going to Skype, it, uh, it's compensating for that, so that's why they're hearing at a normal level. But go, I'm uh, actually driving this from my computer, so let me know, guys, if, if that level is better. I have turned up uh, uh, several dB since we started, so let me know if that does get better. Uh, all right, back to you, Ryan. Cool. So um, as Kyle mentioned, this is going to be in that training links folder that we sent you guys uh, and that you got the QR code for at the beginning. We'll show you that again at the end. Um, I think Dan sent out the link as well. But this is the manual that will show you the menu structure for the SD rack. Um, as mentioned before, the D2 menu is a derivative of this, so you're going to have a lot of the same functions that you would see in a D2 rack as you would in an SD rack. Now, the way this works, as you move up and down on the buttons next to your SD rack, uh, Kyle, can you go back to the Matipod for a second? I know this is going to cause some extra animations, but if you see uh, with that little display, there's actually a left and a right arrow key above the display, and there's an up and a down arrow key to move through those menu options. So, Kyle, if you can get us back to the uh, the uh, menu now. Okay, on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, bud. All right, so here, if you if you move uh, vertically through these rows, that's using the up and down arrow key to move you through. So you're going to start with things um, like uh, the, do you want to default the rack? Uh, I think the, the green, single green um, square in the middle of this page that shows things like uh, receive is Maddie Main, um, sync is Maddie Main, um, showing it's at 48K, and it's got four letters at the bottom, WMXO. That is your main screen that you're going to, when you unlock the SD rack, that's what you're going to be presented with. So you can actually go up a few more menu items to things like defaulting a rack, uh, what the rack type is, the version, um, software, firmware versions for the different cards and things that are in there as well. Or you can go down. So the first thing you go down to is the OptiCore ID. We're going to jump into OptiCore in a minute, but just know that everything needs a separate ID that's going to be on the network. This is where you change that. Down from there, you have fiber speed. If you are running a console like an SD10 and you're connecting to older Digi racks. Those are going to run OptiCore version 220, and you're going to need to be running at 1G speeds to connect to those. That's running older firmware, that's an, a lower speed. If you're connecting with SD racks, you're going to need to be at 2G speeds, and that's OptiCore version 221. Now, you cannot mix these two, so it's important to know that, uh, which is why they physically transmit at different speeds um, across that network. Down from there, you have that USB selection that we were talking about. That's USB selecting uh, either the rack control or OptiCore. OptiCore. Uh, down from there, you have set sync. Um, now, in, in, by default, your rack should come set to sync source as auto. And what that means is it's going to start going from the leftmost connection point um, that's listed. Those four letters I mentioned earlier at the bottom, WMXO, is the typical order. Uh, auto means it's going to look through all of those, and whatever is leftmost so the W would be the first one. That is word clock. That is the default. And it means word clock is going to override all of the other clocking sources. Um, so auto is just going to look through what it has. Whatever the le leftmost is, it's going to grab. Now, walking through these a little bit, you can actually change this order. So uh, instead of dealing word clock, Matty Main, Matty Ox, and then OptiCore, you can change this around. So maybe you want your word clock as a backup, but you want Matty as your main. You could do something like that as well. Uh, 
Pretty much though, it's most common to leave it as auto, uh, let it sort itself, and then um, keep in mind that you're probably only going to run uh, OptiCore or Matty. You are not gonna be running both. Um, if you do, typically the rack will take over and clock off of, put all the output and the control and everything off of that Matty connection. It's gonna look for it as far as a sync and as far as routing is concerned. Um, so you change that uh, down below as well in what they call the sync order. That's the bottom row that we're looking at here. I'm not going to read all these for you. I know you can do some reading. Kyle, if you could just jump onto the next slide so they can see the rest of the hierarchy of the menu. You're going to see options in here, as we mentioned before, about Matty Split Main and Matty Split Aux. So that's Matty SM Split Main and Matty Split Aux SX, on, um, just to abbreviate those so they fit on the little display. Um, and then we can actually change whether those are running at the system sample rate, system divided by two. So if the SD racks at 96K, we'd be at 48K. Um, and you're gonna have a couple other options to configure those as well. Uh, things like rack type. So do you want it to show up like an SD rack? So meaning I'm sharing it with another Digicode type console. Do I wanna show up as just MADI? So 56 channel MADI or 64 channel format MADI as well. So all those options are made in there. You're also gonna have things like the gain tracking uh, that you can turn on for those ports as well. But all that's gonna be handled through the menu. And a lot of that functionality can actually be done directly from the console when you're connected to it. Hey, Ryan. Sir. There's a, a quick question I want to answer about syncing um, and the optical loop. Uh, mm -hmm. says, someone says, can I sync optical from an external word clock connected to an SD rack? And it sort of goes back to what uh, Carl was saying earlier. You know, and that auto order you have that's word clock, Maddie Main, Maddie Aux, optical. If you clock to optics and you insert the word clock, assuming it's in, uh, in auto mode, adding the word clock to the rack will override the optical clock that's on the rack. And actually, if you're if you're applying that word clock to a rack in the system, that rack actually like puts its hand up and goes, I'm now in charge of clocking, and it then propagates clock around the loop from there. So you can override optic loop clocking from its default, you know, engine, lowest, lowest ID engine taking the clock um, and, and using that as a master round by putting word clock into a rack. But unless you have a really good reason to start messing with the clocking scenarios and the, the structure of that my suggestion is you don't you, you yeah. let you let the engine and the way you know the self-negotiating clock is designed to just take care of it um and you know it's synchronous audio across the entire system uh so unless you have a very good reason to, to start doing it my suggestion is you don't since we're here, one of the most common scenarios we see is um, like a, a house of worship or a performance venue, something that has video, like, um, excuse me, once again, like a video broadcast suite, um, and then their audio system. Uh, and what you typically want is if you have like a MADI connection directly into a video router, um, or you have um, connections between these two that are digital, and you want them to stay together, uh, so they need a common clocking reference, typically what we do is we take a high quality video clock um, that's gonna generate a word clock output in addition to all the video sync protocols it needs, and you're gonna have that run into that first SD rack, so the lowest SD rack ID on the network. The beautiful part of this is, if you leave everything in auto, what'll happen is when video is up and running, our entire system is going to clock off of that. And if video shuts down for whatever reason, powers down, then our system will continue to auto-negotiate its own clock. So it actually won't, it doesn't stop, it doesn't freak out. It's just like, okay, my external word clock is gone. As Dan mentioned, that SD rack that raised its hand and said, hey, I'm clocking master now, uh, will just go away and it will continue on um, just like nothing changed, which is a really seamless way to move back and forth uh, in installations like that. Yeah, there is no uh, there is no audio quality performance advantage by applying clock to everything. Um, you know, it's not going to sound any better, unlike you know old studio days twenty years ago when you could improve the sound. Um, and ultimately, all you're going to do is complicate things. So um, you know, don't think you're going to you're going to make it all uh, sound different or better by putting some some clock in because you're not. Thanks, Dan. Um, all right. I was, you know, going to do that a little more politically, but, you know, that works oh. great, too. Uh, um, anyway, not gonna okay. Happen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, okay, so, Kyle, what's our next slide that we got on there as well? I can't remember. Uh, before we uh, leave this slide, let's talk about uh, the split option from the uh, hierarchy uh, for the output cards. 
Okay, so um, this is actually kind of cool. And we talked about Maddie's split. So if we want to actually take what's coming into the input side of this rack, we can have that not only come out Maddie main, Maddie aux, and Maddie split. We actually have a software option to be able to take whatever's coming in card one and have it mirrored to come out of output card number one, or would actually be the eighth slot on the rack. Uh, so the way that works is if I plug something into, let's say a mic pre-card uh, slot number one and socket number one, so the first input on this rack, I could have the same thing that's coming into the rack come out of the rack in slot number eight, socket number one. Uh, this is just a one-to-one. -one. So whatever I do to this first one, it's gonna come out of the second one. Uh, and the beautiful part of that is um, if somebody needs a split to an analog setup, so um, you're running everything into your rack, you don't wanna run through some sort of splitter, um, maybe the splitter they have is not a fantastic quality, but they still want an analog feed from your rack. You can use your available analog output cards on your rack to split whatever's coming into the rack to the physical outputs on the same rack, uh, which it, uh, can be really handy in certain types of situations. I believe we have a couple of performing arts centers who are taking advantage of this. Uh, they bring in analog consoles or something like that, or um, if they have an existing console in the venue that they want to tie into from analog, they can use this format as well. So. All right, now uh, physically talking about connections again, we have an ST12 this time, and you're gonna see there's a cluster of four BNC connectors, and we have a red and a blue cable going from the console to the BNC connections on the D2 rack. Uh, so this time we are connecting at 48 or 96K. This page is 48K. So we're having two cables, one send, one return from the console to the rack. That's gonna give us 48 channels out of this D2 rack. If we were on an SD rack, that would be 56 channels out of it at 48K. It's gonna give us half that at 96K. And remember, we're doing a max 100 meter distance between devices. And once again, 75 ohm, RG59 or RG6 cabling between those. Next, we're actually looking at 96K. So leave the red and the blue cables in place and add the yellow and the green. So we're gonna have a total of four connectors, four cables uh, that are coming from this SD12 to the single at D2 rack so we can get all 48 channels at 96K. Same type of cabling, all that good stuff I just mentioned before. Just want you guys to see that in detail. Ryan. Sir? Yeah, so I uh, wanted to bring up about the RG59, RG6 cable. Um, we have heard from people in support before. Um, our guys have seen that pay attention to your RG6 cables if you're using. Um, RG59 is, is going to be, you know, the typical standard. Usually all the connections are the same as far as your, your BNC connection. We uh, Sport guys have said they have seen RG6 cables where the actual pin diameter is slightly larger. And so yeah. they have, uh, if you take that larger diameter and you plug it in, it will mate that one time, but then it's going to expand when that, you, that, that. When center. you come back with an RG59, after the fact, now the center conductor is too large and it's gonna be an intermittent connection uh, inside of there at best. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, so mm -hmm. just, just heads up on that, RG59 is what we recommend. RG6 can be used in a pinch, just, just pay attention. Most of the RG6 are going to be fine, but they have uh, ran into some issues. So, And I do believe um, somebody can probably correct me on this because it's YouTube and there's a comment section. So correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I do think there actually um, are RG59 connectors for RG6 cables as well. I believe that is something that you can source um, just to confirm you have the right uh, pin diameter uh, there. All right. Thanks, Kyle. What are we on to next? All right. So we're going to talk about, uh, just like we mentioned before, actually sharing two consoles, sharing one rack. So in this case, we have an SD12, and then we have an SD9, uh, and then we're going to share a single D2 rack between them, just using MATI. So here we have a D2 rack, and I'm actually, in this case, connecting to the monitor console is the SD12. And I'll tell you why we do that as well, but you're gonna see there's two cables going from the SD12 at the bottom to the D2 rack, um, the input rack, so it's doing send and return. You'll notice from the D2 rack 
to the SD9, there's a single cable going from the output. So this would be the MADI aux on the D2 rack going to the MADI in on the SD9. Now, the way this works is that both consoles are going to see exactly the same channels in exactly the same order, assuming they're set at the same sample rate. Uh, so we're going to see those same things. They're all going to see gains. So the mic pre's move at exactly the same time on exactly the same channels. The difference here is that the SD12 has the return connection to the rack. So that one is actually going to connect control the D2 rack. It is not only going to control things like routing and sync, it is going to have the physical outputs out of that rack also. It's going to control the mic pre's. All of that is going to happen based on the connection from the SD12 to the D2 rack. If we wanted the SD9 to be in control, we would remove the connection going from the SD12 to the D2 rack, and we would instead put that from the SD9 to the D2 rack. Um, so we would move that around if we wanted the other console to be in control. With MADI, only one console gets to be routing master, sync master, and with that comes things like mic pre-control, et cetera. So only one console gets to do that with MADI. One of the many benefits of OptiCore is the ability to be able to split up things like multiple consoles controlling mic pre's, multiple consoles can share, well, divvy up the output cards uh, between them. So uh, now what Kyle has shown us here uh, next to each of these consoles is we actually have a couple of menus from the uh, respective consoles. So you're gonna see that SD12, we have a network page and you're actually gonna see on that network page, it is set to audio master. That means it is pushing controls to the rack for things like mic pre, phantom, et cetera, any type of, um, uh, like if there's a pad on that particular rack or something like that on that input, it'll be able to control that. Um, below the network page, you're actually gonna see the audio clocking or what we call our audio sync page. Um, and you're gonna see that it is set to master. So that SD12 is the clock master. It is generating clock, which is traveling to the D2 rack from that blue cable, it is being passed onto the SD9. So we need to set that SD9, we need to turn off Audio Master, which is gonna tell the software, you do not have control over the mic pre's uh, via MADI. Um, and then you're gonna see on that bottom right uh, window that it is looking at the clock off of MADI 3. And the SD9 is clocking off of the D2 rack in this case. So normally, the rack is just gonna follow whatever MADI input comes into it. The clocking is gonna follow with that. But in this case, it's doing that, but it's also passing on that clock back to that SD9. So the SD9 can follow it. If we did not switch the SD9 and it left it on master as it would be in a default session, then we would have two clocks that are fighting each other. So we would end up with things like clicks and pops. You would have slips in the audio. Um, you would have audible artifacts to that setup. So if you forget that little step, um, you'll hear it and you'll be like, is it a bad cable or did I forget to change the audio sync? Um, and typically audio sync is, is the most common issue there. So your main console, the one that's controlling the outputs, the mic pre's, et cetera, set that one to master. The one that is getting the split from the rack, that one needs to be set to follow clocking from that rack. Anything to add here, gentlemen? Uh, before we go on, there have been some people asking about uh, slides um, and if they are able to get access to this. We're not going to share the whole presentation um, because it's several hundred megabytes. But uh, in this case, we are sharing a PDF version of this. So what we're going through as far as the keynote portion of this uh, presentation is in that same Dropbox folder that we shared. And it's under the Quick Start Guides. Fantastic. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so... Let's see here, Matt's, uh, never mind, we're good there. Audio IO, so what we're doing here is the same type of setup, but this time we're doing it with SD9s using CAT5e or CAT6 cabling between them. Now, one of the things you cannot do with a CAT6 cable is you cannot choose to connect half of the cable. We can do that with a BNC. We can say just the send, just the return, or both. With a CAT5, since it does send and return, we have to connect the entire thing. Excuse me. Once again, the SD9 um, uses these uh, boxes called a little red box. Um, a little uh, LRB is the analogy we're using here for it or the abbreviation for it. Uh, and that is... Um, 
The little red box is designed to basically do just what I was saying, to connect a portion of the cable without connecting the full thing. Uh, it lets us take something like a D-Rack, which has a single Cat5e, Cat6 connection, and share that single rack between two consoles. But we need to choose who's gonna have full connection to the rack. So in this case, that SD9 at the bottom, that SD9 is full gain control. It is audio sync master, just like the slide we had before. And it is going into full connect on the little red box, which is pushing clock to the D-Rack and gain control and routing, etc. So audio outputs. That word clock, after hitting the rack, is returning back to the little red box and being passed onto the receive only SD9, which is the SD9 in the top right portion of your screen. Um, and that is um, going to be set to external sync, meaning I am going to clock off of my Cat51 MADI source. Uh, you'll see in that audio sync window that Kyle has for you down in the bottom right, um, that is actually taking clock off of the rack, um, which is what we want in this case, just like we did before. So just remember, it's exactly the same thing when you're dealing with Maddie Cat 5e or Cat 6 as you are dealing with Maddie B and C. The difference there is that we just can't connect half of the connection. So if we want to split or share, we need something like the little red box uh, to be able to do that function. All right. Uh, Kyle, what are we on to next? All right. So here um, we have uh, two SD12s. Um, and we're actually connecting them just like we were before. This is going to look very similar to that first slide. Uh, and you're going to have the uh, SD12 at the bottom have a send and return to the D2 rack and then a split off of here going to the second one. And once again, we're just showing you that the bottom one needs to be audio sync master. The one on the upper right needs to be receiving from the rack for this to work. And only one cable. All right. Take a breath now, we've made it through Maddie, uh, and we can actually move on to OptiCore. Um, now, OptiCore um, has been around for a while, uh, been in development, gone through numerous versions, firmware versions, uh, software and control versions, obviously added a lot of features. The core, the backbone of it, uh, since we have seen it, um, has been uh, rather unchanged, uh, meaning that the, uh, the way the network works uh, is essentially the same. And a brief overview, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of different devices that are all connected together optically, so via optical cables. Uh, these can be whatever type of connector you want, but we need the connection between all of them. It's gonna be connected in a ring, so a ring topology. So we're gonna show you this in more depth. Everything gets an ID, so consoles get an ID, uh, SD racks, mini racks, nano racks, D racks, um, orange boxes, they all get an ID. Um, and that ID is different from every other one. And that lets us um, just see those devices and to auto discover those devices on the network. Uh, the cool part about the ring topology, as we're gonna get to in a second, is it can be configured in either a redundant loop or daisy chain configurations. You have a lot of flexibility with how this is deployed. So big picture, 504 audio channels at 48 or 96K. The big important thing here, it is provisioned around 96K. So you do not lose channels when you go uh, to 96K. And that is one of the biggest reasons to use OptiCore is if my system is running at 96K and I have a lot of IO, it's very economical. It's a very easy way, very simple way, cabling wise, to get everything between those devices. So 540 cha 504 channels at 48 or 96K, and that is per loop. On consoles like the SD12, the Quantum 3, the uh, Quantum 5, the Quantum 7, these all have options for a second OptiCore loop. So you can have another set of 504 channels if 504 just is not enough for you for some reason. All right, now onto the topology. It is a ring-based network, as I mentioned before. That means we can connect it in daisy chain. I can take one cable, which has two conductors or two strands of fibers, um, and I can go from an SD rack to a console and I'll have full control and I'm done. Uh, more commonly though, we are gonna close that loop and we are gonna go from the SD rack back to the console um, and we are gonna create a big loop. We're gonna have diagrams for you in a second. Now, standard fiber as we uh, typically once again sell it in North America is going to be multi-mode and this is 50 micron dash 125. Um, that is good for about 350 meters between each device. That is not 
the entire loop that is device to device. Uh, once again, for our American friends, uh, it's just shy of a thousand feet uh, is the distance there. And that is between device to device. Um, as we were talking about the more panel mount connectors, barrels, things like that that you put into a BNC cable can degrade that signal over the effective length of the cable. Um, it, it happens obviously very different with fiber, but it still happens. Uh, so we're not looking obviously for a voltage loss, we're looking for a light loss, uh, and we usually measure that in dB. Um, so. Um, these cables, um, that 350 meter effective length would be assuming that you're basically taking a cable and going directly from one device to the other. Though I do know you can stretch that a little bit if needed as well. Um, and then depending upon how many connectors you have, if you had in, let's see here, five meter jumpers and you connected, you know, 300 um, or 30 jumpers together, you're going to be dealing with enough loss that that effective distance won't make sense in your setup. So just keep that in mind as you're laying out your systems. So, um, and this was once again, just between one device and the next, that is not the loop as a whole. So um, that is multi-mode. We do have an option for single mode. Typically we see these uh, are our broadcasting friends. Uh, so whether that's sporting arenas, complexes, um, people who are just heavy into video, maybe they pulled single mode uh, throughout the facility. We have a couple of arenas that are this way. Um, some churches that are this way. They pulled single mode fiber, they have it. We do an option for that as well. Uh, so this is nine micron uh, is the typical one there, though we can, uh, you can special order um, to, to match whatever wavelength that you need to on that as well. Uh, now, regardless of the type of fiber, multi-mode uh, or single mode that you're using, the connector can actually change out based on your needs. Um, if you're in a touring application, that HMA or expanded beam connector uh, is incredibly rugged, uh, robust, simple to make the connection once you've done it a time or two. Um, and it is it is just a beautiful connector to work with. We have people that have had them for uh, well over a decade now. Um, and those uh, cables and connectors are still going strong. Um, the downsides to them, obviously, with something that well made, there's a cost. There's also a field serviceability aspect to them. Uh, if somebody runs over uh, and cuts through your HMA cable, um, we need to send that back to a factory service center to be able to find where that connection is. Typically, they cut it the cable at that point and add on two more connectors. Um, and so you have two shorter cables out of your single longer one. So there really is not a lot we can do on repairing those. Um, they can repair the connectors and stuff like that or put new connectors on them if needed, but it is not something you're gonna be doing in the field. Um, the next most common you're gonna see is ST connectors. Um, these look like actually like mini BNC connectors, um, but they do have the, the fiber uh, in the center strand of them. Um, and those are very common on installs. Uh, so some place that a console is not moving. We'll also see them in broadcast a lot. Uh, typically your higher end broadcasting, um, uh, I'm, what am I thinking, networks is actually the word I was looking for. Um, those, uh, when they deploy a truck to something like a sporting event, uh, which we don't have anymore, hopefully soon. Uh, but when we have those again, um, they're gonna have a fiber technician with them. That fiber technician is metering those connections, cleaning those connections, they're on site. So while we don't recommend somebody to tour around in a portable situation with ST fibers, uh, in, I mean, if you weren't, uh, you know, an um, optical technician, um, a fiber tech, maybe that's worth it to you, uh, but they're just not rugged. They're not designed to be uh, definitely for permanent installs. Now, somewhere in the middle is a Neutric Optical Con connector. Uh, this takes those uh, relatively fragile LC connections uh, like you would have inside of a device or you've probably seen on network switches and equipment, and it puts a rugged housing around those connections. Now, it has a simple barn door structure that is sealed. It's designed to keep out uh, a little bit of dust, definitely dirt, debris, uh, all the big stuff in there. Um, it's, a, it's a good quality cable, um, but for us, it's somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. It is not as rugged as an HMA connector. When we see optical con cables failing, it is typically due to strain relief. Um, so you're not putting a service loop on that cable. People are pulling on those cables or you have a heavy loom of cables pulling on that optical con connection, uh, and that is typically where we see them fail. Um, but uh, we also would highly recommend them uh, for like a portable monitor application in a performing arts center or in a house of worship. In a semi-rugged application, they're going to do okay in that application. It really depends on the level of um, the level of 
of ruggedness you need out of that connector. Um, there's plenty of jokes about handing an HMA connector over to a stagehand uh, and that um, cable actually surviving that uh, encounter. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving on from there, uh, so once you've chosen your connector, uh, you've chosen your mode of fiber, whether that's single mode or multi-mode, um, we're back to the same kind of benefits of MADI. So it's 24-bit PCM audio, uh, meaning it is not packet-based. We do not have to wait for IP-based uh, communication uh, between these two. There's not the kind of a network inherent delay that you would have as a packet-based network. Um, and uh, OptiCore is nice enough to have measured it for us, uh, and it's 41.6 microseconds, um, which is pretty pretty fast. Um, so there's very, very low latency across the OptiCore network, which is awesome. Now, uh, you'll see at the bottom of this page, we actually refer to Technical Note 101. Um, so Technical Note 101 is in that folder as well, and it actually has a lot of information on calculating losses, uh, what you can expect in a typical connector, um, uh, kind of recommendations on how many connectors you can put together in an application. Uh, if you are doing an installation, it is highly recommended that you have some sort of optical meter. Uh, our support team, uh, the UK support team, can recommend a brand to you as well, but you can measure the output directly Directly off the console, connect the cable, measure it off the other end, see how much loss you're getting through those. Um, a couple of installs I've had the pleasure of going to work with, we've actually found bad cables, brand new prepackaged cables from manufacturers that had, you know, 9, 12, 15 dB losses directly out of the box. So brand new or packaged, brand new cables. We were wondering why nothing was working. We metered it and come to find out it was just a bad patch cable. So something to look out for as well. Yes, well, Kyle. Um, we had a question from Chris Carnell. He says, is there a hardware difference on the console between multi-mode and single mode? It's a great question. So on, if you looked at the inside of a Digico console, um, you would have what's called the engine. Um, that audio is the audio engine that processes the audio. And sitting on that is going to be a separate PC board. That's a daughter board. Uh, and that is going to be the OptiCore PC board. Within that, you have SFP cages. If you're not familiar with optics, um, it's uh, something that's called, I think it's small form factor pluggable was the original name behind that. Uh, and these are removable uh, transceivers. It's got an in and an out on the actual SFP module. Um, these are gonna change from single mode to multi-mode. They are different wavelengths of light. So uh, diving into a little bit more depth, a multi-mode is actually um, more like an infrared. So it's a broad spectrum of light. It is not a single wavelength, it's a broad spectrum. Uh, it is typically focused around 850 nanometers, um, which is what the, the wavelength of what we use for multi-mode, but it is a, a wide spectrum. And then single mode is the opposite of that. It is a single wavelength of light, typically done with a laser. I think they have other ways of doing this now with some diodes, um, but you're basically picking one wavelength of light. In our standard case, it's 1310 nanometers. Uh, and those are just, we swap out the SFPs and we swap out the cables, um, what we call jumpers, that go from that SFP to the chassis of the console. I would say just uh, there, there are four SFPs inside uh, a rack. Um, make sure you swap them all because you can end up in a situation where you could have half of your rack being multi-mode and half single mode, and you wouldn't be able to tell from the outside which was which unless you'd labeled it properly. And it's just a dangerous, it's a dangerous situation to be in. So if you're going to swap between multi-mode and single mode, um, do do your whole system. Now, one of the cool things about a lot of you that are on this webinar right now um, is you, if you're a, you know, a high, a heavy into Digico user, you've probably run across some really um, unique situations where you've needed certain things out of Digico. So one of those that I got to be um, at least talking with uh, one of the uh, uh, production companies who helped support this is you can actually mix and match single mode and multi-mode. The danger here is exactly what Dan talked about. Uh, if you swap out SFPs and part of your ring to do like a longer run, maybe make it out to where a broadcast truck is, et cetera, you don't have to convert the entire ring. You just have to convert both sides of the both devices that that other third device that is single mode is connected to. Please mark them. 
please swap them back when you get back because they are absolutely not compatible and will not work um, when you get back um, and, and inevitably you'll be in a rush, that rack will go back out uh, and you'll be on site trying to troubleshoot that, uh, which we've also done a handful of times uh, for people as well. Dan, I know you have too. Yeah. So um, anyway, so yeah, um, the UK has been putting out um, a lot of the single mode ST connectors uh, with little yellow washers um, around uh, things like the orange box, uh, the DMI cards, stuff like this. Uh, it's a really helpful way to notate uh, what's going on. So if you see yellow washers around things like an opto DMI card or something like that, um, those are single mode. Um, all right, Kyle, could you bring back up our slide for us? Cool. Uh, so getting a little bit deeper into OptiCore, uh, there is some firmware restrictions we put on the loop, kind of assumptions that we made, and this is primarily to help you set up things faster uh, in the system. So rather than being infinitely configurable, we actually fixed a lot of these things for you. First off, we have 24 IDs that you can have on a single loop. So the first 10 IDs are actually related to consoles. So you're actually going to see here that we're limited to five consoles per single loop plus a redundant engine per console. So that means you can actually have two OptiCore IDs per console, so the primary and the redundant. So that accounts for 10 IDs. The next line down, you see that there are 14 um, IDs that are available for things like SD racks, mini racks, nano racks, D racks, orange boxes, and then at the very bottom, there's a, some OptiCore hardware uh, straight from OptiCore that is compatible and supported via our software, and you can add those into the loop as well. But keep in mind, you have 14 rack IDs that are available for those devices. Once again, that is per loop. So if you have a second loop, you need more stuff, uh, I know who you are out there as well, because we've talked to a lot of you guys, um, then you, uh, if you're using up more than one, you need to add the second loop just for enough channels or devices in there as well. Now, as mentioned before, 504 channels, that is inputs and outputs per optic loop. Um, both count towards your total. So if I was taking 256 inputs into my console, I would only be able to take 248 outs out of that same console to fully saturate or fully use up an entire OptiCore loop. Does that make sense? Cool. Did I do my math right on that? I think I carry that. Yeah. All right. Now, fantastic. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I just have this YouTube video around forever, everybody making fun of my math. Uh, the next one down um, is you actually see we have something called Virtual Console Sense. So this is an amazing feature that they added um, initially on just for the basic stuff. Like I wanna send a talkback mic from front of house to monitors, I want them to be able to hear me. I wanna send you know back and forth the other direction, maybe some playback music from front of house. Uh, the monitor engineers is actually doing the mix for the lighting guy. We're pushing that through the console um, for however you wanna set that up. That was the initial intention behind this. However, you, our users, have taken this to a whole nother level. Um, and this, we've actually changed the firmware to accommodate for this. Assuming you have channels available on the loop, you can do 56 channels of virtual sins per console. Now, what can I do with this and why would I want that? Uh, there was an amazing um, show of performance um, in several years ago in New York. I'm not gonna mention who it was. I've mentioned this in uh, previous training classes before, but the artist went all out. Did, I think it was six or seven nights, entirely sold out, as you would imagine, um, and they just kind of spared no expense, as it was said. So they had an SD7 at front of house, an SD10 at monitors for the artist, an SD10 at monitors for the orchestra and band, and then they had an SD10 in a separate room that was doing live, real-time mixing of the orchestra. And that engineer would take those, all those orchestra inputs, mix them down to 28 stereo groups, and put those 28 stereo groups onto the fiber sins, uh, those op what we call OptiCore sins. So those pre-mixed orchestra was available to all of the other consoles. So if the monitor engineer that was mixing the artist just simply wanted to pull up the violins, he did not have to individually go through each violin microphone, EQ them, high pass them, group them together, work through that. He could just pull up the individual violin section as pre-mixed from the other engineer uh, that was in kind of like a portable studio uh, that they set up for him. So that is an awesome application. So you can use 
use it as anything as basic from I want to take a talkback mic from front of house to monitors, or I want to send video elements that I'm taking in locally. Um, however you want to handle it, um, this just provides you with additional flexibility. We actually uh, had a, uh, sorry to interrupt, we had a great application of it where uh, one engineer was sending the oscillator across the loop to all the other consoles and using that to duck the main artist's vocal on every other console so he could have private conversations with the artist uh, without anyone else listening in, um, without telling people to mute it or whatever. So, you know, as, as Ryan says, there are a whole bunch of uh, applications and we've done similar things with, you know, multiple SD7s, orchestra premix, putting stems out. Uh, we did a big George Michael gig with five SD7s doing exactly that. So, um, yeah, it's it's it as, as we'll come to it can be a little bit tricky to set up, but once you've got it up and running, it's uh, it's uh, a great application. Yeah, and the key here is just flexibility for you. Um, so we've just tried to put in extra room into the format, into the structure, so that you can do what you need to uh, for your setup. All right, uh, continuing on down uh, to the next one, uh, just reiterating 48 or 96K is supporting all of those, everything we just mentioned before, all 24 devices, uh, 24 IDs, um, and it can do all that with 504 channels. Uh, included in that 504 would be the 56 channels of virtual console sends, and it can do that at 48 or 96K. Now, the way this all works and why it's so easy to set up is that all of the surfaces, so all of the consoles, uh, Q3 or an SD10, they can see all of the inputs from all of the racks. So they can control a mic pre or they can be receiving what that mic pre is doing, but every console is gonna see all the inputs from every rack on the system. You don't have to configure anything, that's the way it shows up. What you actually configure is who's gonna control the rack, which Kyle is gonna walk us through later. Outputs can be assigned to any console on a card by card basis. Kyle, if you can go back to my camera view, you're actually gonna see um, on my, right on the side of my screen here, I actually have some output cards into this rack. Now I could take card number one, that could go to front of house, card number two to monitors, card number three to monitors as well, because of course monitor engineers are special and they need more outputs. Now. Uh, here, that's just an example of it, but those can be individually assigned. Kyle has some more um, kind of flow charts, diagrams, software to show you how this works in depth. Last thing on this page um, is that we can natively support from the consoles uh, OptiCore a DD32, that's an AES IO box, uh, DD2 or DD4, that is a MADI BNC or optical, the two is the BNC, the four is the optical uh, IO box, an S6R, which is a 16 IO box, 16 in or out or 8x8, AES analog, you kind of choose, just way to drop it on. I believe it supports intercom now as well. So there's a, a comms version of this, so you can put your comms on the fiber loop if you wanted to. Uh, PG16, anything with a PG in front of it is actually the clear comm version of the OptiCore box. So a PG32 is the AES version, that's from ClearCom. Uh, the PG2 is the um, optical, or sorry, BNC version um, of the Matty IO box. And then the last thing to note is there's a really cool box called a Broman Route 66. And they've also marketed this as an OptiCore auto router. So you may see the two uh, interchangeable terms. Uh, what that basically does is instead of just having a loop where you go from device to device, 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 back to the other devices, this lets you connect um, like front of house and a front of house SD rack to the Route 66. And then you go to two SD racks that may be for the stage. Then you go to the monitor setup. Uh, and then you go to maybe a couple of single mode SFPs get put in there and you connect to a broadcast console or to something that is far away, maybe another venue entirely. And this creates a what is essentially a star but it is very importantly still a loop. So it is sending in and out and it's just auto connecting that loop for you, which is pretty cool. Definitely a box to check out. If you need more resources on that, please let us know. We can get you in touch, uh, not only with the OptiCore team, we could probably help you with most of that as well. All right, I need to catch my breath. And now we have some system examples. Um, so um, this is an award show that we made up in PowerPoint um, because copy and paste is cheap. Um, so here we have a SD7 or a Quantum 7. Of course, it's a Quantum because once again, this is PowerPoint. So it's a Quantum 7 that is doing the front of house of for music. So it's doing the music mix for those that are in the room. So we're going to give that IDs 1 and 2. 
The reason it's got two IDs is the Quantum 7 has two audio engines, two consoles in one. So it's gonna have a main and a redundant. The main is always an odd number. So that is ID one, and that redundant is ID two, the even number. You're gonna see there's a front of house production. They're the ones turning up the microphone for the celebrities to accept their award, uh, and then turn it off when they've talked too long, turn up the bumper music, etc. right? So that's getting IDs three and four. Monitors for stage A are IDs five and six. Monitors for stage B are seven and eight. And we have a broadcast console that is IDs nine and 10. Cool, all right, let's throw in some racks. So once again, copy and paste is cheap. So we have a lot of SD racks in here. Uh, IDs 11 through 18, you're gonna see on those SD racks. Uh, and then we have a, a four mini racks and two nano racks. Um, we got bored of adding stuff at this point, so we just kind of left it off there, but you'll see that we've used all 24 IDs. So each of those racks gets a separate ID. Now you'll also notice that we've connected everything here with a cable. And if I take a cable like between the broadcast console and the SD rack, you're gonna see has arrows on both ends of that cable. That cable is handling bi-directional communication. That means from that rack number 18, to the broadcast console numbers IDs 9 to 10, we are getting send and return. So it can control that rack, it can hear everything from that rack or receive everything from that rack, it could send out to it if we assigned it that way in the software. Now, for those of you who have been around Digico, you'll understand that there's something missing here. Now, this will all work. This entire setup as you see it will work. Matt Larson, why do we not want to run things this way? Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> I popped off. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Why do we not want to run our setup just like we have it? Oh, well, because if you were to lose, let's say, ID number 15, the, the SD rack was to lose power by somebody accidentally tripping over the power, or the optics card went, you would actually lose all those other cards. The, the racks, I'd say, um, 11, 12, 13, 14, plus all the mini racks. Same as if we were to lose, say, um, the third SD rack or desk, if that was to power down, you would lose your optical loop. So we have another cool slide that we could show, right? It's Let's just a it. just a quick little line. So what we always recommend is connecting the last device. It doesn't have to be ID24, just the last device without a connection back to the first, uh, and that is going to complete your loop. So now... If Matt's scenario of power gets lost to ID 15, if that rack loses power, somebody unplugs that cable, Mr. Forklift driver runs over that because you didn't put it under the cable ramp because you were too busy, runs over that thing and destroys that cable, well, now that entire rest of the loop, IDs 14, 11, 12, 13, 14, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, are all going to connect to all of the consoles the other direction in the loop. This is amazing. It's a very inexpensive way to have full redundancy in your setup. It's uh, it's just that easy. Now, I think Kyle has another slide. We're actually gonna show you a real life wiring diagram. So this is all using HMA connections. So this was um, a uh, in a large event, uh, a conference that went on in Atlanta a few years ago. Um, and you're gonna see we have things like a monitor riser that has a console uh, connected to it that has four SD racks on it. There's a front of house console out there. There's a broadcast suite, a video truck, uh, and then an uplink connection there as well. So these, this is a pretty massive real life application of this. And you're gonna see that it's got all the IDs listed it is not in any sort of numerical order, and that's okay. OptiCore does not care the order it is physically connected in. So that allows you to do things back to what Dan was talking about, where we wanna maybe wanna connect our clock to the lowest ID on the network. So you don't have to physically have that lowest ID as the first in the chain. That can be wherever it needs to be for other practical purposes, such as wiring, IO interfacing, et cetera. Um, so I'll let you guys stare at this for a minute, but you're gonna see there's three SD7s in there. Um, broadcast is IDs one and two, monitors is three and four, uh, front of house is five and six, and those are connected uh, in a very creative manner um, to the monitor riser, uh, allowing for that loop to be established um, and just pick one like A and just follow it. It's gonna go to B on the SD rack, uh, A out into B on the next device, A to B, A to B, A to B, A to B, all the way through that, making a beautiful loop. Um, now, um, can, I just is, jump, can I just jump in there actually? Yeah, you know, please do. Uh, of course, A to B, you know, do stick by the A to B rule. 
But on a system like this that might get pulled apart and uh, you know rebuilt night after night as you're touring a production, label everything. Make sure you connect it all the same every night. You know the same racks, the same cables, linking the same nodes on the optical network. Because if you have a problem, you know where to go and look. You know there's no sense of oh, did I plug it in there? Did I plug it in here? You know where where am I going with this? So you know all fine. Any order of IDs, any order of racks connected with any, you know, length of cables subject to the rules, but be consistent about how you connect it up night after night with the same cables in the same places because ultimately it's going to make your life building a system and troubleshooting it a lot easier. Yeah, the, and, uh, go Ryan, ahead, Kyle. While, while we're talking about this, since he's actually, um, he's actually on the stream where he was earlier, this was actually brought up by Louis Adamo with High Tech. Um, he and... Uh, 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 Matt Mannix, who is with Method Production Group, who is one of the audio production managers for this event, they came up with this. And again, the big thing is in the previous diagram, we saw you showed a loop that's, you know, device to device. In actuality, running cable like that would just take you forever. So taking two pieces of fiber to each location, and then you're just injecting yourself into a loop. But as Dan said, make sure everything is, is, is labeled. So when you have to troubleshoot, you know what the cable equals on each end. I, I will take this opportunity to tell you that we do highly recommend, you know, device to device. So something like B on a device to A on the next device or A to B, whichever method, but pick one and stick with it. Um, Kyle's going to show you a page in a minute under the diagnostics menu uh, where if you follow a methodology, it's going to be a lot easier to track down issues. Um, hang on. Sorry about that. Um, for cough drops. Exactly. All right. Um, so hopefully um, that's understandable there. Um, and then we're going to continue on um, with the keynote as well, just showing you a little bit more uh, in there. Now, once again, PowerPoint, copy and paste. It's really easy. But this is a way to show you. Uh, so this is, um, I don't know what it is, but uh, we could create it in PowerPoint. So we did. Uh, but this is somebody who obviously needed a lot more IO uh, than a single loop was going to provide. Um, so we have five SD7s or quantum sevens in there. We have double the amount of racks that we had before and uh, entirety. And you're going to notice there's a red loop and there is a green loop. And that's representing one OptiCore loop is red and the other OptiCore loop is green. Uh, you'll notice that something like the um, uh, SD uh, Quantum 7, the first Quantum 7, that is IDs 1.01 and 1.02. Uh, that is so from top to bottom. So that means it is ID 1 on the first loop and ID 2 on the first loop. And then since it has two loops, it also has ID 2.01 and 2.02. Um, and so that means it is ID 1 and 2 on the second loop. Now, there are a whole host of other kind of um, uh, best practices that you need to follow when you're doing two loops. Um, and so once again, we have documentation on a lot of this. Please reach out to us. If you're getting into something this complex, we are here as a resource to be able to help you both at Group One in the United States, as well as Digico support in the UK and your distributor. Um, great resources to be able to reach out to if something is at that complex level. All right, now here is a typical setup. Uh, we have a front of house console and a monitor console. Monitor is ID one, front of house is ID three. The reason we're skipping two is that would be left for a redundant engine. Um, so a, a, a whole nother redundant console, or it could be like a Quantum 7 that has two engines in it. You're going to see that we have two SD racks. This is IDs 11 and ID 12. So those are the first rack IDs that are available to us. We just connect them all. We have that red cable to signify closing the loop. So that is a simple loop that runs between all devices. We have redundancy between these. If the cable between monitors and front of house gets cut, disconnected, et cetera, we are gonna get audio in that um, longer loop uh, from throughout the SD racks and back to the console. All right, now let's go on to a mirrored setup. So it's gonna change slightly. This is two quantum threes for front of house. So you're gonna actually this time use ID one and ID two. So these are the same consoles. We're gonna network them together via con that control ethernet port so they can share the session between them. We're also going to have uh, OptiCore looped together and we're gonna set ID one and two for the primary and redundant. Um, you're gonna see we still have SD racks 
ID 11 and 12. Uh, and then we have pulled up the network tab uh, under your master screen, under your uh, SD or quantum software, that's gonna show you kind of how this looks. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have a console, nor did Kyle, uh, that we didn't have two of the same console to be able to set this up for you. So it's gonna look slightly different than this, but you're gonna notice if you look closely that there's an A and a B. Kyle, if you can point to that, and under the B on the primary console, it says not found. So that would be like if we didn't have these two connected together via a network cable. It wouldn't, the session wouldn't see the other console to be able to connect to. Ideally, you would have those connected with a network cable that's gonna allow them to truly mirror between each other and act as a real-time, fully redundant engine. So this would be like they weren't connected because we didn't have two consoles. Um, but anyway, so these are connected up and you're gonna see Audio Master is turned on uh, on engine A. Now, for the redundant engine, you're gonna see that engine A is not found and then engine B is connected and it's the Audio Master. In reality, only one of those engines can be audio master. On something like a Quantum 7, we actually display it on one of the overview screens to let you know that the audio master is engine A or the audio master is engine B. So which engine is responsible for processing the audio and pushing that out to the SD racks or other devices that you have connected. Now there's a little bit more to get into there. If you look down the right hand side of that uh, menu, I think Kyle, you're gonna go through this later, right? Yeah, I'll go through it. Okay, cool. Well, we won't cover that, but there's a way to send those selections, uh, sorry, send those sessions between engines as well as mirror. Uh, and there's actually some options to set up the method that it mirrors in. All right. So here is a quantum, uh, quantum 7 just showing you what that looks like on a single console. Uh, so we have two engines on this console, ID1, ID2, and then it connects to those racks, uh, the IDs 11 and 12 to form a loop. All right, so to break this down, we set everything up in a loop, two SD racks, one console. Now, if we're using ST connectors, we're actually gonna do that slightly different. Is that the next slide? Hoping it is, fantastic. It is going to look topology-wise the same. We are still gonna go from one device to the next, but you're actually gonna have two individual strands when they're ST connectors. Uh, I believe we have a, another slide that actually goes into more detail on how this is set up. So you'll actually have the same type of thing we were just looking at. There's an SD10 with an A and a B connection. You're gonna follow the same methodology as your HMA connectors. We are gonna take A on the SD10 and we're gonna go to B on the SD rack. Um, and this is gonna go A to B connection, and if you follow those lines, you're actually gonna go A out on the SD10 to B in on the SD rack. So those are the two red lines symbolizing one cable but two strands of fiber between them. This is when you're breaking it out for ST connections. You're gonna notice the green connectors that go from rack to rack, so rack ID 12 to rack ID 11. That's into out as well, A to B. And then we're gonna complete the loop using the blue cable that goes from rack ID 11 two back to the SD10 into out as well there. So the whole idea here is that out on A goes to in on B and out on B on the same device goes back to the first device on um, in on that A. So we gotta have a loop between the two uh, and we gotta have a loop overall. A lot of that happens automatically with an HMA cable, but with STs you physically need to wire it that way. All right, I think I finally get to take a break. Kyle? Yes, you do. That, <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Uh, that's a lot of stuff to cover in a little over an hour and a half. So, all right, next what we're gonna get into is uh, we're gonna get into uh, the curriculum that we actually use in our Digico Master Series program here in the US. So uh, I saw a lot of the people that have registered through Eventbrite. A lot of you guys have been in our class before. So in our class here in the US, we ship around between 12 and 15 desks to each city. Um, we do carry these and then we might do 10 to 12 cities in the fall. This year, probably gonna be a little bit different, but, um, but with that, what we uh, do is, um, we, one of the most important things that we go through in class is the actual setting up of OptiCore. We're gonna talk about Maddie a little bit more in this next section, but um, inside that class, what we wanna make sure is everybody understands how to map OptiCore and where all the, uh, all the mapping issues actually come from. So um, in our classes, we set up uh, up to uh, five desks that are on the OptiCore loop and a couple racks. 
and devices, and we go step by step setting it up. And it might take us 20 minutes to do this. But the reason we do it is because we have so many users and setting it up. If somebody makes a mistake, we can point out what the mistake is. So it, it's uh, by having this many devices, most of the time you're gonna have two or maybe three consoles on the network. And by having this many devices, if something uh, happens and you see a mapping error, we can actually point out what is actually happening in those cases. So um, by the way, uh, for uh, the future, I know a lot of you guys that have come out to this training before have recorded this procedure of setting OptiCore up from the ground up with all five consoles. If you do have a link to that video and the quality is fairly good, uh, make sure you send me a Dropbox link at digicoinfo at g1limited.com. So if you have one of those videos, then maybe we can uh, produce it a little bit, clean it up, and then uh, help uh, share that, whether it be YouTube or on the Digico Master Series uh, Facebook page, uh, something like that. So, uh, all right, first thing, when we're getting into our console, um, first place I will always go is I'm gonna go into my network settings. The reason I do that is this is one of the things that your file does not bring over. Your console will remember what its last network setting is. So if you're on tour and you're a monitor guy and your number, uh, your console ID is number one, before you start loading your file and mapping OptiCore, you wanna verify that that, uh, that ID is still correct. So before you even start loading, go and look at your settings here. Again, one, three, five, seven, and nine are gonna be your primary engines. Two, four, six, eight, and 10 are reserved for redundancy. Make sure before you get going that not two consoles are set up on ID1. This will also create issues. Most of the time it's gonna be ID1 is gonna be monitors. ID3 will be front of house. So verify those settings. Uh, then you're gonna make sure if you're using OptiCore, just make sure Audio Master is turned on. This also allows uh, the console if say our clocking priority is always the console with the lowest network ID on OptiCore. So if ID1 is that monitors and he has to turn off for whatever reason, we wanna make sure that clock still establishes and the, the ownership of uh, cards and, and sockets on the racks um, still exists. So you wanna make sure that audio master, which is in green in this picture, is selected anytime you're using OptiCore. The only time that's not true is when you're on an SD7. Again, like what Ryan was saying is, you have an A and a B engine, so IDs one and two. So you're only gonna have one audio master in that case. But in the case of just primary consoles, just everybody make sure you turn on your audio master. Uh, from there, the next thing I'll do before we even get into our setup for um, uh, mapping OptiCore is I'm gonna make sure everything is corrected, uh, correctly, uh, uh, connected in, in our system. So this is showing you a very simple setup, uh, IDs one and three, and then ID 11 on the left-hand side. So ID 11 being our rack. So you can see there uh, where it was highlighted in red is everything is okay. If for some reason you had an error between ID one and ID 11, both of those would show up as ERR or error. So that is showing you where the actual loop error is uh, is occurring. So you know you need to look at that cable between ID 1 and ID 11. That is the cable that's actually bad. So as Dan said, if you've labeled your cables on each end, now you know when I go to troubleshoot, that's where I actually need to look to, uh, to make sure that that cable is uh, connected correct. Um, the thing about this, uh, OptiCore will map correct when you do the mapping uh, procedure it will map correct even if you don't have the redundant loop. But uh, in certain situations, and Dan, you can interject if you need, but in certain situations, if you have consoles um, of different, you know, maybe somebody's at 987 um, and somebody's on 1069 or, you know, a newer version, sometimes when you're pushing mapping, if you don't have a redundant loop, it's not going to pass through the whole network. It may only show up uh, one way. Uh, if you push it from one console, it might map correct. If you uh, push from the other way, it, uh, it may be com completely fine. So in any case, look at this page. This is under system and then diagnostics and your OptiCore tab. The other thing you're gonna notice, let me grab on my mouse here so you can see uh, me highlighting this. 
you're going to want to make sure that your loop one is showing two gigabit uh, speed. Uh, that's your, your speed of the OptiCore network. And you're at 221. So that's the newest OptiCore version. If this is showing uh, your loop is at one gig, you're going to be on version uh, 220, and that's also going to create issues. The other place you also want to look is down here. We have uh, seen in certain situations, somebody goes to grab an OptiCore card out of an SD rack and if your console is showing SD rack instead of SD engine here, you're going to have issues also. And in that case, you're going to need to call support and uh, have us walk you through or we'll uh, point you to the OptiCore uh, reprogramming of the OptiCore card. So then it's then uh, meant for an engine as opposed to a rack. So just pay attention to this. This will save you some time in the long run. If you, if you know everything is hooked up correct from the get-go, then it's going to save some time later. The biggest thing when we talk about OptiCore is uh, every device that is on the network, every console needs to have a matching, matching devices in, in their list here. Um, thank you, uh, Tony Luna, for this picture. This is an event we did uh, probably four or five years ago. He was in one uh, venue. I was in Atlanta. He was in Houston. It was the same show. But in this case, what we wanted to make sure is for every, uh, every console on the network, we all have the same rack devices. If, for instance, you've got uh, the front of house console doesn't need some of those con sends and they take those, those, uh, those audio ports out of their list, then you're gonna have an issue when you actually go to map. Every, every console has to have the same devices. They don't necessarily need to be in the same order. Um, in the case of a touring and setup- And I would say they don't, they don't necessarily have to be using the racks, but they have to be defined in the in the session. You know, Correct. Even if you, even if you have no intention of taking the audio from it or outputting to a rack um, and have no channel allocation to it, they still have to be present. Correct. Yeah. So you can choose not to use it, but it does need to exist in 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 that audio I/O port somewhere. Um, what I'm saying here is, in the case of a touring setup, we have multiple bands using the same control pr pr uh, packages. It is best practice to have all bands using the same audio I.O. port structure. Front of house and monitor audio uh, structure doesn't have to match in their port orders, but all your front of house console files and all your monitor console files should have matching audio I.O. structure and port order. This just prevents you having to remap every time you do a session load. Now, obviously on a one-off, you're doing a festival, bands are coming in, um, you're gonna do your session uh, loads and then you're gonna need to remap. But in the case of actually, uh, if you're touring, you know, maybe you're sitting down for rehearsals for a couple weeks, take this, uh, take the, your structure and then just send it to the other engineers so they can build their file and then the audio IO is just, it's already there. All they have to do is patch their in and out uh, to those. So where that's, uh, where we're actually gonna do that, let me pull up uh, my console screen here. So where I would go next is if I'm on, uh, you know, I'm in rehearsal, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into files and then I'm going to go into my session structure here. So if I've already have my file established as far as my audio IO order, which I've got something set up right here already, and maybe I want this for uh, all the bands that are on my front of house console. So it's already established for my file, but I want to pass this on to other people. So now I can go in and just choose what sections I want to get rid of maybe inputs, my auxes, and my groups, I wanna just get rid of those, those positions. Um, and now when I save that file, I can save it. They can rebuild their input list, they can do their auxes, they can do their groups. Um, if you need to, you can even get rid of the effects. But this is on a, on a segment by segment basis of what is actually going on inside your console. You can clear those sections out, save it, send it to your guest bands for them to build that file. And then when they, all they have to do is their audio IO structure already exists in this order. All they have to do is patch to that. So when you go to map later, you're gonna map at the very beginning of your tour, save your files, and then when you load each time, there's not the complexity of having to remap because that audio IO structure is, is different from band to band. Um, the other thing that I wanna show on this page is down here. 
it's either Digirac default or SDRAC default. I don't have an OptiCore card in this, so that's why SDRAC default doesn't actually highlight. But in the case of, uh, of these two audio I.O. buttons down here, uh, what you have to realize is when you actually get into building your file and you need to convert it for later, keep your MADI ports in the structure. I'm going to go back to, um, go back to my uh, file here. Actually, I'll just show you on, uh, I'll just show you on this page here. So at the very top here, you see your local IO, then you have your rack one, two, and then uh, port three. So that is what is default for an SD9. If you are not using your MADI ports on your desk, maybe you're only using OptiCore, do not delete these ports. Leave those in there. The reason is if you need to come, you know, convert your file to another console and you've deleted, your, uh, deleted those ports off the original console, they will not exist when you go to that other console. So there can be issues if you add, try to add that port back in, there might be issues with uh, controlling rack data, stuff like that. And so in that case, you're gonna have to go back in on your new file and go into your session structure and then select you know, uh, SD rack default, restructure it, and that's gonna rebuild your order default to whatever your console is. So just do yourself um, uh, a favor, keep those, those audio IO ports in the, the correct default structure for the desk. Yeah, actually, that's because you know when you patch a uh, when you patch an input into a channel, the channel is referencing a port number, not uh, an identity of a rack, or you know it's not saying oh it's an SD rack version, you know ID twelve or whatever. It's actually going this is port one, and so when you move it between consoles or need to need to you know do something to your session, you need to make sure that those port numbers remain uh, constant and don't don't change. Thank you, Dan. All right. So after we've done our network uh, settings, then from there, I'm gonna go into our audio sync. So with this, anytime you're running OptiCore, you're gonna select OptiCore in every instance. In the case of running MADI, that's when we go back to the diagrams that Ryan showed about 20 minutes ago, you might select master in the case of if you are creating clock on the, the network for MADI. You're sending it out, maybe that SD9 is receiving its clock from the SD12 that's at, at uh, monitors, for instance. So in the case of MADI, you're usually gonna be selecting master or maybe MADI 1 or MADI 3 ports, MADI 1, 2, or 3. But in the case of OptiCore, always select just OptiCore. Um, at the very top there, you'll see active sync source, so you can have a primary and a backup sync source. So if OptiCore um, isn't present on the network, it will automatically fall over. But uh, anything to add there, Ryan? No, no, I think that's great. Okay. Um, again, pr uh, look at uh, technical note 300. This is in that Dropbox folder. Uh, we sent you earlier, um, and uh, it's going to go into more information regarding uh, word clock and audio sync operation for a lot, a lot more inform, a lot more detail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony Crockett, wherever you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, we already went through the slide earlier, so um, just to reiterate that, though, in the case of our consoles, our consoles create the clock. Our racks do not. Our we're sending clock from the console. It's going to go through the little red box, and then in the case of the top right corner, the SD9 is receiving its clock through the little red box. So the bottom console is establishing the clock on the network. The console on the upper right is receiving its clock through the MADI Cat5 port number one. From here, we're going to go into our audio I.O. section. So first thing, again, as we said earlier, if this is showing you an SD10 and we're at 96K, so you'll see local I.O. is port one. And then ID, uh, the number one in the audio I.O. port section is showing rack one and it's default to an SD rack in this case. So you see MADI one slash two. If we're running a 48K structure, it would show port one, port two, which is hidden in this case because we're running at 48 uh, or we're running at 96K in this case. So port two would show up and then it goes to waves. Anything uh, that we're dealing with on the console 
uh, say, depending on what desk you're on, it might be ports one through five. You know, you've got on the, the uh, Quantum 338, you've got three ports, uh, technically it can be up to six, depending on how you're running it. But your, usually your last port in your audio I.O. list is gonna be Waves or your DMI cards, depending on what desks you're on. So those are what's local to your desk. You can change those around if you need. But again, do not delete these if you are not using them because it's just gonna create issues later if you have to uh, convert your file. Uh, about SMUX and high speed, we're not gonna, for time's sake, just uh, take a picture of this. Take your phones out, I'll give you guys a few seconds. Take a picture of this. The big thing with this is how it splits up the MADI stream between SMUX mode and high speed mode. Um, with this, there's not a lot to get hung up on because if you are connected, a send and receive to your MADI port with a device. So if I have an MGB hooked up to my MADI 3 and I toggle high speed or SMUX, then in the software for my MGB, for instance, it's automatically going to follow that back and forth. So um, just know it is there. You just wanna make sure each device has the same, uh, the same settings on each end. How this is actually split up, this is showing you, um, it's technically channels one through 28 or one through 32, depending on if you're standard MADI or MADI 64. But how that actually works is an SMUX MADI is taking up to 64 channels really, but it's splitting it. So channel one A and B, two A and B, three A and B, so on and so forth to get all the channels. When you go to high speed, you have to have two MADI cables connected. The reason is, if you're in high speed MADI and you're at 96K, you're really only seeing 48K because it goes 1A, and then in this case, channel 29 is showing you the other part of, of that uh, MADI stream. So if you've got one through 28, you're seeing part of that stream, but you're only seeing half of the bandwidth. So one through 28 at 48K, then channels 29 through 56 equals the other part of that 48K stream to equal 96K. So if, um, real quick, I'll just jump in. If any of you out there have ever, ever read, ran into some weird channel routing, channel layouts, um, things between consoles um, or to devices, this is usually what the culprit is. Somebody's running a 96K in a different format. You may be running at 96K or at 48K. Um, and when you kind of run across these together, uh, it'll just, it'll be really weird. Uh, things don't correlate. You start skipping uh, every other channel uh, or you have audio showing up on two channels worth, things like that. It's usually a mismatch between either the sample rate or high speed and S-Bucks. Yep. And, and I would just add yeah. to that, actually, uh, if you get the high-speed versus SMUX wrong, um, third-party recording interfaces um, can get really upset by it. You can actually crash uh, a certain MADI interface from a, another company um, by feeding it the wrong format of MADI. So you just really need to make sure that you understand, if you're running to a non-console product, what format of uh, 96K it needs to be talking to. So, Dan, when you have that issue, what, what should they do to resolve that? Read the manual and see what it is. I mean, most bits of kit these days uh, will do high speed and SMUX. Uh, the only sort of big one I'm aware of is the Avid MADI interface. Um, and it's not me picking on them. It's just their interface only does high speed, doesn't do SMUX. And if mm -hmm. you, you know, it can get, get confused. Similarly, actually on that front with MADI, if you feed channel 57, our control channel, at bits of kit that aren't expecting to see it. Similarly, they can go a little bit wonky. And then is that just a power cycle to yeah. resolve that yeah. issue? Remove, remove the offending MADI stream and power cycle it and most things recover. Mm -hmm. Okay. As we get into OptiCore here, um, as I said earlier, the biggest thing that people don't really realize, we've had uh, engineers that have been touring with uh, you know, their kit for quite a while and then maybe they go to make a change where they may be changing consoles in the SD line, upgrading, um, and then where they've been running for three years and not had a single issue, they go to another desk and then all of a sudden they can't remember exactly how they set it up originally and then you'll see mapping errors. Usually when they send us their files, it's just because an engineer doesn't realize that 
he has to have everything that's on the network that the other console does. So he's like, all right, there's three, there's three racks on the network. I only need to patch from two of those. I'm not gonna include that one. Well, you're gonna get a mapping error because those devices don't actually match. So again, on front house and monitors, they don't have to be in the same audio IO port structure, but the devices have to exist. And showing that there again, you can see on this is coming from an SD7. So our, we have our first four MADI ports. We left them in because of just the rule. It's good to just leave those in there. Port five is waves. And then from there we go to anything that is OptiCore driven. You can change your ports, that's anything that's local to your desk, but if you start changing ports in the OptiCore section of your network, that's when you start to run into mapping errors. So this is just showing you two of the desks. I built the file, one on the left, Tony Luna has a better camera than I do. Um, one on the right, uh, that was my console in Atlanta. So I built the file, so our monitor files um, in different cities were exactly the same, but and we had actually three venues, so everybody's file uh, had to have the same port order. All right, so for this, let's go into uh, Ryan's desk real quick. You ready, Ryan? Yeah. We're gonna show this part live. So Ryan has a Q338 at his house. Um, so for Don't this- we all? <laughs> I only have an SD9, because oh. that's all we could carry to the basement. Um, so, uh, First thing, when you go to add your ports, I'm usually gonna select the very last port in, um, in our list. So in this case, the, Ryan's got a Clang DMI card in there. So you're gonna select the very last port, and then from there, I'm gonna to go to add port. Then I'm gonna select what the actual device type is. So I know Ryan has an SD rack, so we're gonna select SD rack from the list. Next thing you'll see, it just shows that it's not connected. The reason is there's a DMI card that is, is gonna be selected by default. In the case of if he had a, uh, say like a, um, like a, another a DMI card of some sort, it would actually go to the first OptiCore ID. The reason it's, it's uh, going to the DMI2 is because there's not a card in that slot right now. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna go ahead and he's gonna select OptiCore 1.24 you want to uh, select the rack that had whatever the network ID of the, that rack is. Typically, from the factory, they, they go through all the different ports, so the, when you get a, uh, an SD rack from the factory, it's gonna show up as 1.24, then you can change it to 1.11, which is the lowest network ID if you needed to. In this case, his, uh, his rack there is 1.24, and then, Ryan, can you just point out where it says mismatch on the cards down there? So right there, it sees the rack. It shows that we're connected, but we don't have the information. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the conform rack button. In just one second, I'm going to uh, take your name off the screen here, Ryan, um, just so uh, it's not covering up any of this. There we go. All right, uh, so now when you hit the conform rack button, what that does is the conform feature is reading something that's on the network. When you remap, that is putting those audio paths into play. Conforming is reading the path. So when he did that, it shows the rack that he has, which has, uh, looks like seven 32-bit uh, input cards, and he's got three analog output cards, and then he's got an AES in the very last position there. So from here, if he needed to change and release a card to the network, he doesn't have another console in his garage, but if he needed to, to release one, he can go into set up OptiCore there, touch on the card, and now that is released. So now if other desks are on the network, they could actually grab those by using the same procedure and touching on those, and then they would be able to grab them. Go ahead and uh, and go ahead and remap at this at this point. Okay, so now everything is mapped. Everything is good. He's he's using a single console. Ryan, I'll come back to you here in a, in a few minutes. Um, before we do that, let's uh, let's show them the conform all ports thing. Uh, so, Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and delete that port. And then hit the conform all ports button there. 
So the conformal ports can be very useful. Um, this button I would use if I am building a show from the ground up. Uh, if I've never done that show before, I'm gonna set up all my consoles, all my racks. I'm con con gonna conform and then I'm gonna start building my show. Conform all ports for me as a touring engineer wasn't very helpful. Um, the reason is usually when you have a file established and you go to uh, you know, bring it into a guest console, for instance, or you're going out again with uh, the same control package and you wanna make some adjustments. If you hit conform all ports in that case, your port order may be different. So where in the case of uh, where it says number five there, uh, Ryan, can you point at the number five audio port? That port right there, for your file it might be there in this case. But in another situation when you conform all ports, it might show up in port number seven. So when you actually go to your file, all your patching is associated with you know, the, that, that port number five equals kick, snare, hat, so whatever, and you know, so on down the line. If it's in seven, now you're gonna have to redo all your patching. So the conform all ports, again, I find it very useful if you've never done the show before. You're gonna set up all your equipment, conform all your ports, and then from there, then you can actually go back, uh, you can start building your show. All right, while we're in this uh, page right here, you can see he's spinning up some gains on some of those inputs there. And then go ahead and uh, just hit default rack while you're there. You can see all the gains that he just dialed up are now back to zero. Um, so from there, he's adding it back in. He's adding 48 volts back in. Go ahead and hit default rack. See, so that once, uh, this is another way, I usually tell people to default the rack on the faceplate of the SD rack, but if you don't, once you connect to your system, if you don't want to have that gain data pulled over, um, then just go ahead and default all your racks so they're in a, in a zero state uh, from the get-go. Uh, the single console button there, Ryan, um, that button right there, it can be helpful if you are the only console on the network. The issue with this button is if you have three or four consoles on the network and you push this button, it tries to uh, grab ownership of every input and output card and saying you're a boss. So in the case of, uh, we'll show you later how to, once you get everything set up on your network, go ahead and lock it. So functions like that aren't easily accessible. Do, Ryan, do you want to tell them the story on that one? <laughs> yeah, we just, we had an award show and it was the first year they were moving the entirety of the award show over to, um, uh, they were moving the entirety of the award show over to Digico on a single loop. So we had a couple of operators, very experienced engineers, but it was their first time on Digico. Um, I would happen to be there visiting one of the systems uh, engineers that was responsible for the setup. And, um, yeah, just somebody decided because they needed to remap. Um, I think they changed uh, the input side of their console, so it actually showed up to remap inputs. Uh, and then the, the single console option was there as well. So um, this gentleman pushed that button, uh, which, of course, took all the output cards away from all of the other consoles. Um, they had actually were a day and a half, I believe, into rehearsals. Uh, thankfully, no audio was going at this time. They were just doing camera blocking and camera placement and stuff like that. Um, so a bunch of errors get thrown up across all the other consoles. There were four consoles, I believe, on the setup. And uh, yeah, everybody freaked out there for a minute, but um, just reloaded sessions, um, it, you know, had the gentleman, uh, thankfully, very quickly came up on the intercom and said, hey, uh, I just I just hit the button. I think that was me. Um, and so we were able to determine what it was, reload sessions. Didn't end up being a big deal. Um, but uh, yeah, it can definitely make your heart race uh, in those types of moments. Yeah. So um, going into it a little bit further. So once uh, once you actually grab that rack, even before we, we map uh, OptiCore for the first time, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and go to um, the splits and sharing section of the desk. So with this, in uh, the audio IO page, you're gonna go into splits and sharing. Then you're gonna go into the selected rack. You can either be global full control or I usually do it per rack. 
and then you're gonna go into either isolate mode, receive only, or full control. Um, over to the right, before we talk about the isolate, receive only, and full control, you'll see on the card split section where it says uh, split cards four through 11, you can turn on gain tracking, split all your cards. So that has to do also with the, uh, the hierarchy of the SD rack menu, um, taking that input card one and sending it to output card one as an active split, one through eight equals one through eight on the output side. Okay, so as far as the actual uh, permissions for the uh, full control receive only, so on and so forth, you'll see the SD console in isolate mode will not exchange any control data with the rack. This means that the console will neither be able to adjust rack settings or will it, uh, or nor adjust its own uh, settings according to record according to returning control data. Receive only, this is, receive only and full control is usually the majority of what people actually will use. Uh, receive only, this just means that you are only going to be able to receive, uh, you're only gonna have trim data. The monitor guy is usually gonna be controlling the, the preamps and as he turns up, you only are able to see, uh, you'll only be able to do the trim side of it. You cannot g grab that, uh, uh, preamp at all. Um, and then full control, you're, you're fully in control of that rack sending and receiving. Um, on, uh, on this, you can, this doesn't have to do with OptiCore remapping. Um, you, anybody can go into full control mode from the, from the OptiCore loop. If you have three desks on the, on the loop, any of the three can do it. You probably don't want to do that because not, you're to get, finding three uh, engineers that have uh, the same idea on what the proper gain structure is, uh, is gonna be made different between each engineer. But say for instance, the monitor engineer, he's asleep in his bunk and uh, guitar tech comes out and he says, hey, we've got this new uh, acoustic DI. Can we get it gained up and has a slightly different gain structure? Then at front of house, you can go into full control, grab that uh, preamp, make the adjustment you need, and then go back into receive only. All right, uh, we already showed you how to uh, grab the actual uh, card uh, allocations from Ryan's console there, but you'll see there, if it is highlighted in like bright green, it is allocated to the console and can be changed. That's how he was able to release it. Once you remap OptiCore though, then it's gonna show grayed out. It's that slightly grayed out green check mark that means that he has control of it. The, then he's gonna have to go back in after he's remapped and release it so anybody can grab it. So green means you have control of the card. Uh, red X means uh, it, is it is allocated and anybody else on the network can grab it. Okay, once you do that, uh, then you're able to remap um, per, per uh, desk and remap uh, OptiCore, and now any changes you've made are instantiated on the network. Um, so once we get past this, uh, let's see. If there are no errors, then you're good to go, and then you can start adding your con send and receives. We always will tell people to uh, delete your con send and receives, get your racks up and going, make sure those are green before you go on. Uh, the reason is, we'll show you in the OptiCore details section uh, in just a minute, but that's usually where a lot of the OptiCore errors come from have to do with the con send and receive section. So you want to make sure your racks are good. If your racks are not good, you, what you want to, uh, if, you're, if you are receiving an OptiCore mapping error, it might have to do with allocation of, of who is trying to grab a card slot. So for instance, if I'm using a file from the fall of that year and my other engineer is using one from the summer of that year and maybe at one time we still were both trying to grab the same output slot the OptiCore is going to say hey you know you're trying to map both of you are trying to grab uh, control of one of those output cards and you're going to get it going to get in the air so at this point then what you need to do is look at that OptiCore details tab and then investigate who is is creating the error on the loop so in this case, maybe we've got three different consoles, IDs one, three, and five. 
and we go to do a console or a concert where ID5 isn't there. The broadcast console isn't there. He usually has output cards six and seven on the network. If I want to get, uh, if I want to be able to grab those, I cannot grab it in my file because the broadcast console in his file had it. So it's allocated to broadcast console ID5. He doesn't exist on the network. So from there, what I need to do is easiest way to release this is to actually go back into the OptiCore details tab and then select one of these three things, clear all outputs, broadcast all output IDs, or broadcast only my output IDs. Most of the time, if you clear all output IDs or clear all outputs, what that's gonna do is any output that's on the network that's a, a card allocation, it's gonna release it and then you're just, everybody manually has to go grab it. If it's already built in your file, you can fire a snapshot that could bring you know those that patching back. Um, what we usually recommend is the green broadcast only my output IDs. Usually the monitor guy is going to have the most outputs on the network. So what that's going to do is the monitor guy is going to push that button, and then what that's going to do is it's going to map everything to the monitor console who has the outputs. And then every other console on the network is then going to be able to go grab their original card slots. But it just gets rid of any, uh, any issues that there may be in, in the actual mapping process. Again, the rack part is usually the easy part when you go to map. You map once and it's usually good. If there is an error, I would say, what, nine times out of ten go to look at this. Uh, Dan or Ryan, anything to add on... Uh, Anything that you guys have experienced? Uh, I actually just uh, stepped away for two minutes to uh, to oh, grab a drink because it's because it's uh, it's it's late here, and uh, <laughs> so gotcha. I'm afraid I missed that. <laughs> he has been riveted um, going through all the. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, so no, actually, Kyle, I think you covered it well um, okay. as far as what needs to be covered in that area. It. OptiCore is one of those things that once you come up with a, uh, a kind of a workflow and how you should treat it, it's generally going to be, it's going to work the same for you every day. And like Kyle's saying, until you make a change, and then you kind of have to know what change you're dealing with, how you want to approach it. Uh, best is, as Kyle mentioned many times, communicate between front of house monitors, whoever else is there, make sure everybody's aware of the change. And even if they don't care about it, don't want to see it, Make sure you're all communicating with how that's happening because it is a network. They do all need to talk to each other, um, whatever the changes you are making, as long as it resides on OptiCore. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, the other thing about this, when we go to remap, it doesn't really matter. Any, uh, any person on the network can remap. Just have one person that's in charge. <laughs> when everybody just starts hitting remap all OptiCore, it can slow things down. So. Have somebody in charge, be on your radios, be on ClearCom, pay attention to that. Okay, so once your racks are up and good and you're green, then this is where we're going to go into adding our con send and receives. Um, somebody uh, told me a while ago, I think it was, uh, it may have been Titus, um, who's our, our CTO here in the, in the U.S. Uh, for, for uh, Digico and Group One, but he, he says, think of it as uh, the OptiCore devices are ex existing on two different layers. So your rack devices are always going to exist on layer one. So in your file, you're looking at a rack ID 1.11 through 1.24, or in the case of a dual loop, 2.11 through 2.24. And so your file is looking for that, that rack on whatever rack device ID it is. When you get into doing your con send and receives, these have to do with your console, but it's actually looking at another layer down. So it's looking for ID one, and then underneath that, you've got uh, underneath ID one, let me see if I can get my mouse over here. Okay. It's actually looking for this serial number. So in your file, your OptiCore is remembering this serial number. So this is why when you go from, you, you know, you're on SD12s on tour with your preferred vendor, you go to do a one-off and you go to map right away and you're getting OptiCore mapping errors, it's because the, your, uh, your con send and receives, which has to do with the, your network ID, that's where the mapping errors will, will always occur. So delete the, the con send and receive ports, 
Then when you add those back in, now this serial number that's right here, it's gonna be current to what the current console you're on. And so then when you add your content and receives back, then that's gonna get rid of some of those, those mapping errors there. I would say just, just on that note of adding console send and receive port, um, I always find that if one person adds a send port, everyone else conforms and picks that up as a receive port, you remap, everything's good. If someone else then needs another console send receive pair, the second console will generate the send port that they need with the number of cards in it. Everyone else then conforms, they get picked up as receive ports and you know you, you, you do it. You don't try and everybody add all their console sends and receives all at the same time because inevitably it's probably not going to work. You need a bit of a logical um, sort of step through process in, in putting it together. Yeah, and this is one of the things in inside of our, our class, we do this with five consoles, everybody does con send and receives. And we do it a couple different ways. Um, we usually show them each console as their con send, as Dan said, everybody conforms. The reason is you're always gonna have out of those five consoles, one person that's not paying attention. And that one person by not conforming their rack when you remap OptiCore, you're gonna go, okay, which one of you is not the same? And it will actually put up in the error that pops up where you actually need to look. And you're like, all right, ID 105. You didn't add that, you didn't conform that rack, you are not expecting that, that's where it comes from. So we, in class, and if we can, uh, if somebody sends me a video, we can actually show this. The reason we do it that way is because we wanna get it through people's heads that if things don't match, that's usually where you're going to find an error. Yeah. Ultimately, um, what you're doing is you, you know you think of a think of a highway with lots of lanes in. You're allocating audio to these individual lanes of 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 the highway, this audio highway that connects everything together. So if lots of people try and do it all simultaneously, inevitably these things are going to clash, or you know the exits and entrances off this this audio highway just just don't do what you expect them to do. So um, yeah. Good, yep. good advice there from Carl. Just take your time, do it one at a time, and make sure everyone's paying attention. Yeah. So once in in class, once we show everybody, we conform. You know, each uh, consent and receive. So we put have one person put a consent on the network. Everybody conforms. We remap. We go on to the next one because each step down the line, it's showing we'll remap five times to make sure that everything is correct. Now that everybody understands everything needs to match because usually you're going to run into one or two people that have not are not paying attention and we'll get those errors, then everybody kind of gets on the same page. So once we get to that point, then what we'll do is I'll usually have them actually delete all the ports all the way through their racks because the racks are good to go. Then say, everybody, add your consends on the network. So everybody put your con sends on the network. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, everybody is good. Now, everybody conform all ports. And then when you do that, you have five consoles that put a con send on the network. You conform all ports, and then it's going to bring those con receives from the other four desks onto your network. Then you can remap once. So the big thing about it, most of the time, you're going to be two consoles. So add your con send to the network. Uh, you're going to conform your rack so you see that device, then add your consent from the opposite desk, conform rack, and you're good to go. All right, um, the last thing after that, um, Ryan, let's go back to you. Can you show us on your desk the lock OptiCore feature? Sure. Okay, now if he goes back into cards and sockets, Notice single console is gone. Notice you're going to uh, set up going, OptiCore is what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, OptiCore details. Mm -hmm. See those? Uh, just unlock it and then show that page right there. See those things that are highlighting and going away? If every console locks their network, everybody has to unlock in order to make a change. So once everything is established on the network, lock your OptiCore loop so no changes can actually be made. The only, the only exception to that rule, actually, is that if you oh, are sorry. changing, I believe, which uh, inputs you are pulling from a rack, which has no bearing on anybody else, uh, I think you might be able to change that. But 
Um, certainly in terms of uh, channel allocation within the optical loop and output card allocation, Lock Opticor is your safety blanket. Yep. Okay, um, last thing we're going to go into, um, that's the part of the Opticor demo. What we're going to show you is a couple of other things in the audio I.O. section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over here to my SD9 that's in front of me. And we're going to go through this virtual rack that is not actually connected inside my system. First thing up here, we can add our name. Um, so in this case, I'm calling my virtual rack. You could call it whatever you want, your stage left rack, your stage right rack, whatever that might be. Because this is, doesn't actually exist on the network, if I needed to change a card slot, I can go here and select whatever the card type is in inside uh, that rack. This is also, if you're using the offline editor, if you want to build up a system, this is where you're actually going to go. Um, you're going to select each card slot and do the drop down to build your virtual rack inside the offline editor. While we're in here, um, let me get rid of this floating layer button here. While we're in here, we can go in and uh, name each socket individually. So for instance, if I had 16 wireless mics starting on channel 25 here, I could go to my group name and say, let's say RF section one. We'll go to this card slot. We'll say RF section two. And then here, I'm gonna go into our socket name and I'm gonna say RF We'll say 16 channels. And then I'm going to select auto name. So you'll see right now, channel 25 is RF, uh, R, just RF. Now if I hit R, auto name, now you can see the next 16 channels on my list are auto, automatically named 1 through 16. Now if I need to do actually go patch, I can go into my menu here and go into my virtual rack. I'm going to go into RF section one and you'll see it's right now that channel is called channel 42 at the very bottom of the, that highlighted channel is channel 42. So now if I patch to it, you'll see it brings the name over. So in any case, you can label things on inside your rack first and then do your patching. And as long as the channel list name is a default name, it's gonna pull the name over from the actual socket itself. While we're inside here, we, what we can also do is we can go into what's called line check mode. So what line check mode is good for is instead of going through a normal line check on a channel by channel basis on your surface, what you can do is you can go inside here, select a socket, hit listen, you can select 48 volts if you need to on a channel. You can grab the gain if you need to for that channel. And when you do this, you are listening at the preamp level. So if you're going into an insert or you've got a high pass filter or you have a gate, this is before any of that channel processing happens. So you're listening at the actual preamp itself. So it makes it really easy. You can just select on the screen, channel four, channel five, so on and so forth, and you're listening at the preamp. And so again, under cards and sockets, the line check mode right here. The listen uh, is gonna go to either your solo one or solo two buses. All right, anything else I need to cover in here? We've, we've uh, touched on the majority of this. The, um you're, you're about to go into the next section. I think that's all we really need to cover in there. Um, uh, yeah, I think you got it. All right, so last thing, we're not gonna really go over virtual sound check and the hardware needed, but if we needed to take this rack and send it channels like, say we're at 40, uh, 48K, we could send 56 channels of Maddie to one of our other two sources. So in this case, I could send it to my MGB port and by doing that, that's ch taking channels one through 56 and sending it directly to the MGB, a one for one copy off of the preamp. No channel processing, anything like that. It's the preamp only. That raw audio data is being copied from the audio port number five to audio port number three. Now, when we need to 
need to do uh, a uh, you know playback virtual sound check. We just hit listen to copied audio, and now we're listening back for the MGB coming back into the system. There's no other patching that is needed. And the other cool thing about that it is, uh, in the case of if we have preamps, let's see if I have one on channel one here. You have a listen safe function also. So that's, I call that our karaoke button. So maybe you had a rehearsal, band came in, the vocals didn't want to come in. Now when you go and play back your source, now say channel one is, is their vocal. Now they can actually do a combination of the virtual playback along with the live vocal or whatever's listen safe. And you can do that on the channel by channel basis. Last thing, I'm gonna unassign that so it's available. Um, patching to that port is available inside of our copy audio router. But when we go into our copy audio router here, now this is anything that exists on our network. Say if I've got OptiCore and I've got all my consent and receives and my racks, I can take any of those paths and put them on the network for the other desks to actually grab. So in uh, this, I've got my virtual rack and if I wanted to patch that directly to my MGB, now I can scramble patch. So maybe I want these first channels, then I'm gonna skip, I don't need channels 12 through 16, I'm gonna start down here. I can double patch sources. Um, so I find the copy audio router a lot more flexible and being able to pick and choose where I'm gonna send things. Um, in, in the case of, uh, if you think of, you run out of, of room on your SD rack, your inputs and outputs, you're, you are totally used up, but maybe you need to send three more outputs uh, to monitor console. Um, so what you can do is if you have your con sends, take your program feed or whatever you're needing to send back there, take those as a direct output from that aux or group or matrix, put it on the con send, and then at the monitor console, maybe he's not using any of his local outputs on the back of his desk. So what he can do is he can grab some of those sources and take them directly to his local I.O. on the back of his desk. So uh, it just frees up, uh, you know, frees up you having to rent a whole another rack in order to get a couple more outputs or inputs out of the system. So this is a completely flexible router input or output wise. Um, if I de-expand this, uh, you'll see the set listen source button that I'm toggling up here. If I now want to listen Red are the primary pass. That's what I'm listening to if I hit listen to copied audio up here. But if I need to, I can toggle these from yellow to red. Now the red is what I'm listening to as opposed to the yellow path on the network. So, all right. I think that is it, what we were trying to cover for today. Awesome uh, job, Kyle. Thank you for covering that. All right. Uh, let me uh, go back to our screen here. All right, well, uh, thank you, Kyle, for taking us through that. Let's uh, jump into...